Good evening. This lecture Lerfuat Shana's Dvora Elisheva Batsara Mori Nisim Ben Et Yester Lerfuat Shlema Atzlacha of David Ben Turan Tova Natzlacha La Bet Adin and Natzlachat Borit Shimon of's family and Leilui Nishmat Avram Ben Ephraim. One announcement, this coming Monday there is no lecture in Queens. So those who plan to go, skip Monday. We'll be back here next Tuesday, Bezrat Pesach is coming soon, less than a month. We have two, three more lectures and that's it, Pesach is coming. Tov, Baruch Hashem, as you all see, slowly, slowly, the world has changed completely from supporting and understanding Israel to condemning Israel and threatening Israel, and disconnecting a diplomatic relationship with Israel. I think Colombia already, this, you know, they yeah. decided to to terminate their uh, relationship with Israel. I'm sure there will be many more countries to, to follow. And uh, everyone is in panic now. United States turned their back to us. Canada is not selling us weapons. We're afraid that the Europeans soon will stop selling us weapons, and then the Americans, and then we're going to be isolated, and we're only going to be alone. We are all, we're already so alone. Everything I said, is that a good news or bad news? Depends who you ask. If you ask a person that has no God in his life, and is not familiar with the Torah or the Tanakh, he doesn't know Gemara, he doesn't know what the Torah talks about, he doesn't know what God said to the Jewish children of him. He doesn't know. Then it looks like a very bad news. Wow, Israel is more isolated, like the Arabs are cheering. Wow, we were able to isolate Israel. Look, it was paying, paying, it's paying off. Same thing the lefty liberal traders in Israel. They scream, Bibi, look what you did to us. We are hated more and more every day. But those who are God and they know Torah, they know that it's a part of the plan. There are no reason to panic. We are one more step forward into the moment that we all waited for more than 2,000 years. We're getting there, we're getting closer. One thing we do know for sure, that before the Mashiach would come, there would be almost no goyim that likes us. Everyone will be against us. And we will be completely isolated. Am levadad ishkon uva goyim lo itchashav. I'll give you a little parable for you to understand. There is a boy that is in a bad term with his father. Father threatening him, don't touch drugs, he touch drugs. Don't take money from my, from my drawer without permission. He takes money. Come to work, help me in a store. He doesn't come. Don't dress like that. Look at you, look like a homeless. He doesn't care. Have a haircut, look at your hair. Doesn't care. Basically, the relationship between the father and this boy is not so good. So the father decided to be more tough with him. He hides the money doesn't give him the key for the car anymore. When he needs help, he doesn't answer his phone call. So the boy say, you know what? I don't need my father. I have good friends. They'll, they'll help me. Started to have friends. You know, this guy gives him a car when he needs. This guy gives him money from time to time. This guy, this guy gets him the drugs almost for free. He has friends. You can stay by my house for a week. I'm going away. You can have my apartment for two weeks. This guy takes him out to a restaurant. This guy buys him drinks in a bar. What do I need him? My old-fashioned dad. I, am. I have a lot of good friends. They hook me up. 
הוא היה כדי אמריקן בוי סי. קמאן מן, הוק מי אפ. זה גוד מוב. זה היה בדרון לנגוויץ' שלו. בדן, דן, this boy has one enemy. doesn't like him, gives him hard time, fights with him all the time. That enemy started to instigate between him and all his other friends. So another friend left him. And that guy that buys him drink doesn't buy anymore. And this guy doesn't get him the drugs anymore. And this guy doesn't let him stay in his apartment anymore. Slowly, slowly, everything is closing on him. Another friend, and another one, and another one. And the uncle used to give sometimes money, doesn't answer his phone calls. And now, he finally got to the moment that he's about to go to sleep tonight and he begins to cry. I have no one left. Everyone left me, everyone hates me. I'm so isolated. I'm literally in a band. Everyone banned me. And then he started to think, wait a minute, but I still have my father, even though my relationship with him was not so great. Let me give him a call. They call up the father, he said, Dad, you know, it's been a while. How, you, how have you been? Wow, I'm so happy. Well, where have you been? I was worried about you. Yeah, I actually also missed you. Maybe we can get together tomorrow. What do you think? We'll eat lunch together. And I, the way the father got him in, got him his room, got him the car, got him everything. <laughs> then the father heard that his friends giving him our time. This guy is doing this, this guy is doing that. The father said, don't worry. Those who messed up with you don't even know what's coming for them. The father eliminated every one of his enemies, one after the other. Everyone got what they deserve. So the fact that they all isolated him and banned him was a good thing or a bad thing? It got him back to his father. <laughs> That's the language, the language the Jews understand. Only punches and kicks and insult and violence and antisemitism. That's the only language affects them. When the world turns their back on them, they run to Hashem. When the world is opening their arms for them, they kick Hashem. And they did it thousands of times in the last 3,000 years. So now you ask me, what I rather? that the whole world would be nice to us and kiss up to us and tell there's no one like the Jews. We owe them our culture. We owe them about our religion. We owe them for their inventions. We owe them for what they contributed to the world. The world would be a zoo without them. Everybody prays us and Hashem put a ban on us. Or everyone kills us and want to kill us. And Hashem said, don't worry, I'm with you. A very tight handshake. Who in the end will benefit us, they or Hashem? That's the question you have to ask yourself. If you think that Sleepy Joe will help you to get out of your misery, you're nothing but a secular heretic. I mean, yeah, you may have a nice beard, but with beard, you don't buy bread in a supermarket with a nice beard, you know? And it doesn't get you to heaven. Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, the mass murderer, also had a breed a beard, and Arafat, the, the Nazi, also had a beard. So beard doesn't get you to heaven. And uh, if you're not getting the point yet, what's the point of learning Torah? What do you learn? It's history for you. What, what is this? Uh, Shakespeare? What is the point of reading Torah? The Torah is a lesson for life. So, Rabotai, the problem of the Jewish people right now, you can call it Palestinians. Palestinians are one stick in the hand of Hashem. Then Iran, that's another stick. Poverty now, so many people are unemployed for six months already, that's another stick. Hezbollah, another stick. You know, when they hit you in a court, you go to Singapore and you throw a gum on the floor and a policeman just saw you and they arrested you and they bring you to court. Now they're going to give you good smacks with their whip. Doesn't make a difference if the whip will be yellow or black 
או גריי, או וייט, או בראון, זה מייק א דיפרנס. A whip is a whip, right? Today, the, the guy decided to hit you with a brown. Tomorrow, he will hit you with a black. The next day, with a yellow. It's the same pain. Whether it's Hezbollah, whether it was Iran, whether it was the Nazis, or Syria, or ISIS. But everything Hashem does is measure for measure. Mida keneged mida. The Russians were laughing. They were happy to see October 7. Hashem arranged for him a little October 7 also. They laugh at the Israelis that there are worthless security, no soldiers, no police, they're confused, for hours nobody showed up. Exactly the same thing happened to them. The Ukrainians killed two million Jews. They were more cruel than the Nazis themselves. They loved to do it so much. They enjoyed that so much to murder kids and women. They, until today, praise all the mass murderers. They have statues of them all over Ukraine. They never said one word of apology, apology to the Jewish people. Never. What did Hashem do? Send the Russians to drive them nuts. And that's just the beginning. I will not be surprised if Putin will drop a nuclear bomb on them very, very shortly from now. It can happen any week. Because remember, sometimes it's better not to win against the bear. Better to run than to win. If you win, he brings all his friends and they kill you. If they will make some attacks against Russia, and Russia will pay by thousands of deaths, they will have nothing to lose. They're not afraid of the world, Russia. You know they're not afraid of the world. They do whatever. You saw what they did to these ISIS terrorists. Cut their ears off. They cut their ears off. They took pictures of them with no ears. Broke their teeth. Tortured them. Electrocuted them in their private parts. They connected it to high voltage. And they were screaming for hours. And they don't care. They tortured them until they say where they came from. Imagine you do it in Israel. What will happen to you? The Russians do whatever they want. They have China behind them. They have a crazy leader. He doesn't care what the world thinks. So tomorrow he can drop a nuclear bomb on them. I'm surprised he didn't do it yet. I'm surprised. What's holding him? They hate Ukrainians so much. They hate them. What's holding him not for not dropping the bomb? But he, he, anyone would dare to retaliate with a nuclear bomb against Russia for Ukraine? They throw Ukraine to the garbage in a minute. We should die for them? What do we have with them? French, the French people will die for the Ukrainian, the British, the Americans. Who would run to defend them? Okay, so now they dump a nuclear on Ukraine and they just killed a million Ukrainians. Anyone in the world will start a war with Russia? No. Russia has submarines, they have nuclear bombs all over the world. They can wipe out any country in a minute. Why would anyone die for them? with all the sympathy they have for them, with all the help they gave them. There's a limit to how much you're willing to help a stranger. You know? Today I had a very interesting thing on my way here. On the Palisades Parkway, there is a, a gas station just before the George Washington Bridge. So I stopped to fill up gas. <laughs> and you know, the guy that put the gas, I give him a credit card, but I always make sure I have singles in my pocket to give them a tip, not to have Chilul Hashem. See you with the yamaka. They give you the gas, you give them two dollars. Don't have two, you give them one, something. As I give the guy the tip, immediately I saw that he's about to tell me something. This guy, I didn't know what is he, Indian, Pakistani, I don't know to tell the difference. They have the same accent. For someone who doesn't know, you don't know where they are. So that's why I already learned. I never ask someone, are you Indian? And I never ask, are you Pakistani? Because if he's Indian and you ask him, are you Pakistani? He can kill you for that. <laughs> and if you tell Pakistani, are you Indian? He's going to kill you for that. Better not to say what you are. You can only say where you're from. <laughs> don't assume anything. So this guy is, is about to tell me something, and it's very hard to understand his accent to begin with. 
and there's also noise from the cars on the highway. I was trying to understand what he said, and then he pointed to me and an older man that works in a gas station. What? Can you give him a ride? He asked me, where are you going to? I said, to Brooklyn. Can you give this man a ride? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, that's a very, very big catch-22 here. If I say no, Chilul Hashem. If I say yes, maybe this guy is Pakistani from Al-Qaeda, will slaughter me from behind. That's a big dilemma. <laughs> I said, oh, if my time arrives, my time arrives. I said, yeah. He gets in the car. Where is he from? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Doesn't say two words in English. I thought that they learn English over there, India, Bangladesh, they know English. I guess maybe they're from primitive villages, they know English. But when he came out of my car in McDonald Avenue, I went off my way to drop him there. Dahil, Dahil and McDonald. He was standing on the street like this. Ten times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He doesn't know what to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One word he didn't know. He almost cried from happiness. I just saved him his weekly salary. Imagine if he had to take a taxi from there to work. <laughs> They bring them from countries like this, probably pay them $5 an hour. It's a big money there. I don't even know if they're legal, not legal. They're gas stations. That's why when you give them a dollar, they appreciate the dollar so much. Well, you cannot buy a gum here with a dollar. Yeah. In some places that a dollar is so much money, believe it or not. How to believe. Anyway, Rabotai, so in the end, everything that happens to us, it's all from Hashem. By the time we finally get the point, it may be too late for us. Because we have hope in the United States and we count on the United Nations and all the other wicked people, that kind of fake friendship that we have with the United States and the rest of the world, or Canada, or other countries, that fake friendship damaged our relationship with God Almighty. We are paying a huge price for it, huge. If every Jew in the world will know we have no one but Hashem, that's it. No one, as it's written, Am levadad ishkon, you have to know your place. I put you here in this world. The world is all for you. My Torah was made for you. You are my children. You are holy because I'm holy and I made you holy by giving you the Torah. You come from the royal family of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and I don't want you to be like anyone. I forbid you. Do not imitate them. Do not run to kiss up to them. Do not marry them. Do not call your children with their names. Do not mingle with them and get mixed with them. Do not learn from their horrible culture. You have to be completely different. You are the royal family. And what did the Jews do? The exact opposite. All they're trying to do is to imitate the nations. Whatever they, f they check happening in New York, the next day they do in Israel. Happen in Paris, the next day you see it in Tel Aviv. It got to a point that we teach the Goim to do terrible things. I'm not sure anymore who's worse, the, the gays of Tel Aviv or the gays of San, San Francisco. I don't know who's worse, to be honest with you. We have to be honest. In the beginning, they used to learn from what happened over there. Now it's maybe the other way around. I don't know who it was. So, Rabotai, I'll, I'll read to you a few things that you get the point. You know, the Jewish nation, the Torah said that they have three stamps. Three stamps. Just like when you convert a non-Jew, three rabbis sign on his conversion certificate after they saw 
And he went into the mikveh. Three Dayanim sign on a, on a certificate. The Jewish nation also have three signatures on them. One, they are merciful. If you see a cruel person, it cannot be Jewish. Cannot be. What do you mean? I mean, we saw that he was born to an, an Israeli girl. <laughs> his, 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 his mother is Jewish. No, no, no. Her grandmother is probably Mizera Amalek. Jews got mixed in Europe non-stop with the non-Jews. Non-stop. Lithuania, Russia, Hungary, France, England, any country. Any country. Czechoslovakia, Austria, Germany. Jews married the Goim for 230 years. There's no way to know. Unless it's European Jews that, that are religious, non-stop, son, of a father, of a father, of a father, all ultra-Orthodox, then you don't have to worry about their Jewish identity. Anyone that is not Jewish already for few generations, I mean, is not religious for few generations, there is a higher chance that he's a non-Jew than a Jew. Almost all Reform Americans are goyim. Biologically, they're not Jewish. Same thing in Europe. You see, when you meet a Syrian Jew, you don't have a reason to suspect that he's not Jewish. Nobody there married a goyim, not one out of a thousand even. If you meet a Yemeni Jew, don't have to worry at all. Not one Yemeni was ever mechalel Shabbat. If you meet an Indian Jew, as a higher chance he's a goy than a Jew. He may not even know it. Why? The Jews got mixed with the nations there of, in, in India. So it, it's, it's, they, are, they have statistics. They know in each country what percentage of intermarriage the people had. The best place is Yemen. Over there, nobody got mixed with the, with the Muslim Yemenites. Nobody. But in some countries, it was very big assimilation. Like Germany, almost 80% before the Holocaust. So there's no way to know. So if you see someone that tell you I'm a Jew and you see that he's a cruel person, most likely he's not Jewish. And what's the second sign? They have shame. They shy. By shanim, they're not arrogant. They should not have that chutzpah. So. So. Bayshanim, Rachmanim, Vegomle Hasadim. And they're kind, generous. You see, who's the number one in donations in the world? Jewish people. Unfortunately, 99% of them donate to their own causes. Donate to the gays. That's a sin. Donates to all kinds of uh, organizations to make movies in Hollywood, to help new producers to get into the business. That's a sin. Giving money to all kinds of secular causes, that's a sin. Giving money to a reform synagogue, it's a huge sin, or to conservative. Giving money to all kinds of cults in Judaism who idolize a human being, whether he's alive, whether he's dead, it's also a sin. Spending money on pictures of some holy tzaddik Spending millions to put the pictures everywhere, that's not good. With this money, could, many good things could have happened. There's a lot of donations that are going to bring a punishment to the donor. Literally, they'll be punished for that. Because there's a rule in the Torah that Hashem reward and punish a person based on the fruits of his action. So I'll give you an example. When you have so many Jewish kids that cannot afford to go to yeshiva because their parents are poor, and you call some organization, let's say, and you tell them, can you help with the tuition? They, they, they can put the kid in yeshiva as a bright kid. Where is he going to go? To public school? We don't have right now money. We don't have enough. Check with us uh, next year. And the next day, they spend $6 million to put the picture of the rabbi in West Side Highway, $6 million on a building, after they told the kid that they don't have enough money to send him to yeshiva. That's a sin. Huge one. 
because they're going to have to stand by Hashem and he will ask them, what was more important, to put the picture of the tzaddik and the bridge or to send 500 kids to yeshiva that they will grow up from and, and half of them will marry non-Jews in the end because they never went to yeshiva. So what was so urgent to put a picture of it? Holy tzaddik, chas <laughs> v'shalom, not to disrespect any tzaddik. But what is important now? If I want, if I have a, 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 if I have now a dilemma to put the picture of the rabbi that saved my life, <coughs> and I owe him unlimited amount of gratitude. So if I had to put his pictures in places that would cost me, me millions of dollars, or at the same time I could take that money and save more people, much more people with extra cash, and I, I would choose to put the picture of my rabbi, the tzaddik that saved my life, instead of saving these kids. I'm a criminal. Not machzir betshuva and not nothing. Criminal. Why? I owe him gratitude. He saved my life. He changed me. Without him, who know where I would be? No, no, no doubt. It's no contradiction. Admire him, yes. It's my rabbi for life, yes. I owe him everything, yes. Why do I need to put his pictures everywhere? Why burning the money? It's not enough money as it is. People are drowning right now. Every ten, twenty dollars save another person from drowning. Now it's the time to put a picture on the boat. People are drowning next to you. No, but we also save people from drowning. Yes, but you could have saved ten times more. Bottom line, if you really analyze every donation that Jews make in the world, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked where the money goes to. I once told you a story when I went to uh, Beverly Hills for Shabbat. I spoke there in a, there's a very big synagogue, Persian synagogue, it used to be a church, right by the Beverly Hills police. They bought it from the Christians that went bankrupt. Why the Christians went bankrupt? Because Beverly Hills was occupied by Persian Jews. And many of them are religious. There's no more Christians in the area. So that huge fancy church don't have a minion. So they decided to sell it. Who's going to buy such a building? Only either Jews or Muslims. Either they turn it into a synagogue or they turn it into a mosque. Nobody else will buy such a building with 3,000 seats in the heart of Beverly Hills. So the Jews bought it, they renovated the place, they changed the seat, they made it a very nice place, and I had a Shabbaton there. I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe. So they told me in Shabbat morning, after we finish to pray, you will speak to the youth minyan. I saw hundreds of young boys and girls in, in their 20s, their 30s, single boys and girls, youth minyan. Some were married, some singles. I went to speak to them after the tefillah. It was around 11 something. I spoke until 12, midday, it was maybe 600 people, and now we finished. We have to go now to the place where we have the meal. So I'm going out, and one Persian man, my guess he was close to 60 years old, walks out with me, it's inspired by the speech. I spoke about the importance of keeping Shabbat, not coming to shul with a car, giving my usual proofs, and this Persian man, which is not Shomer Shabbat at the time, I don't know where he is today, at that time he wasn't Shomer Shabbat, meaning he comes to shul with a car, is walking with me out, and I saw that the lecture touched his heart. And he started to speak to me with pain in his eyes, how religious they used to be in Iran, and how Shabbat was wonderful until they arrived to America, to Los Angeles, and it was impo impossible for them to be Shomrei Shabbat because they had to open the store and whatever, you know, everyone with their excuses, how they became Mechalelei Shabbat, and he missed these days, he was a teenager there, so many many years in Los Angeles. And you can see Raido is a very wealthy man, but I have no idea who he is. First time I speak to him. And I have a young guy, 20 years old, who's supposed to show me the way to where I eat. I don't know the streets there. So as we walk out, 
there is a, there's a front yard there that everyone stop and talk after the prayers. Lots of people. And the guy, I talked to him about the importance of Shabbat. And then out of nowhere, without knowing anything, I started to talk to him about how sometimes people want to do the right thing, but they ended up doing the exact opposite. <laughs> Meaning that their intention is good, but their action is the opposite of good. And they have a say in Israel, <laughs> The path to hell is full of good intentions. Full of good intentions. You have a lot of good intentions, but in the end, you judge by your actions. So yeah, he asked me, what do you mean? I remember the conversation with him like it was yesterday, 15 years ago. What do you mean? I say, I'll give you an example. Let's say a guy made money and he wants to give an, a large donation. So he has two options in front of him. To give it to a big yeshiva with great guys who give their life for the Torah and learn and make Hashem very happy because nothing makes Hashem more happy than people give their life for the Torah or to give it to the Israeli army. Most Jews, who they would like to give the money to? To the Israeli army. Soldiers, the hero, defending us, we owe them. You know, so there's a list of reasons why they should give it to the Israeli army. Why wouldn't they give it to the yeshiva? They don't understand what Torah is. They don't understand what Hashem thinks about it. They don't understand that it saves the whole world. They don't understand. They don't know Torah. They see soldiers are brave, they go in a fight and they defend the land and they kill murderers, terrorists. It's a wonderful thing. I want to share in it. I want to pay gratitude. But if they only knew the value of the Torah, they would know that they leave the diamonds and invest in silver coins. Now I see that the man, from minute to minute, is about to faint. It's like this. Well, I'm saying to myself, what's going on here? Something is fishy. And now I see the guy that is supposed to show me where I eat. He's pulling my sleeve like this. Rabbi, we have to go. It's late. People waiting. It's late, Rabbi. We have to go. He's pulling me like this. So, well, why this guy is pulling my sleeve like this? Yeah. He tell me we have to live without pulling my hand. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling something is happening right now, but I still don't know what. <laughs> and I said... Besides, when people give money to the Israeli army, do you really believe it comes to the soldiers? I was a soldier. Not once in three years we got a penny that Americans donated. Either people steal it on the top of the pyramid, or they do things with that that you will never even know about it, the, the usual soldiers. You think the soldiers who give their life to protect the land, they get any donations from Americans? It's a dream. It's an illusion. And let's say, I say to the guy, let's say that he would actually come to the soldiers. What the soldiers would do with that? Almost all of them are not Shomer Shabbat. Today it's a little bit different. There's much more Shomer Shabbat, Baruch Hashem, than 15 years ago. But back then, almost no one was Shomer Shabbat in the army. Plus they have girlfriends, which they don't keep nida. They have horrible things. Plus they don't eat kosher, most of them. And they eat without bracha. So what would happen with your money? It would come to some Tel Aviv guy that drive on Shabbat with your money. If you gave them 200 shekel, put gas in his car and go to the disco. What reward you will get? Nothing. You're lucky if you won't be punished for it. But when you give it to Bnei Torah, who give their life to Torah and mitzvot, and they pray and they talk to Hashem, and they put filin, and they live kosher life, and they don't have the impurity of the internet in their life. That revives the world. Now I see that the guy, the young guy, is now being really aggressive. Rabbi, please, I'm begging you. Please, please, we have to go. So, okay, listen, I have to go, I'm sorry. I would love to continue the conversation <laughs> with you. And then I realized that I, probably this guy is getting very nervous and I'm telling this guy these things. I said, as long as whenever we spoke, nothing is personal. It's just to give you an idea 
that someone wants to do something good, but in the end he does the exact opposite. As we walk, the guy say to me, wow, Abba, what did you do? What you have done? I said, what happened? This guy is the representative of the Israeli army in America. He organized all the fundraising. You just killed him. <laughs> For 20 years, he organized all the millionaires here to come and donate millions of dollars. You just killed his entire life. <laughs> so I said to the guy, very good. You don't see that Hashem put words in my mouth? What does it have to do with the Shabbat? We were talking about Shabbat, that he was in Iran, Shomer Shabbat. How all of a sudden I started to talk about donations to the Israeli army. Don't you see that Hashem runs the world? Hashem wanted him not to have an excuse when he died. So I didn't know. I thought I'm doing a, a great thing. I didn't know the soldiers don't get it. I didn't know that even if the soldiers will get it, most likely they would use it against Hashem. Putting gas in a car in Shabbat and drive to the disco in Tel Aviv or to the beach, it's not exactly what Hashem had in mind when he said to give tzedakah to the poor. And that's the problem. Everybody operates with hearts and feelings and not with the head. And that's why we look the way we look, bunch of clowns. Why? That's when you're not educated in Torah, you make all the mistakes possible. So Rabotai, let me give you an example now, something, story from the Tanakh, it's actually a shocking story. You know, 3,000 years ago, we had the first king in Jewish history. Who was the first king? Shaul, Saul, 3,000 years ago. Shaul, even though there are a few stories about him in the Tanakh that are not flattering in his, in his resume, but the Gemara says that Shaul was a tzaddik, and he's a descendant of Esther and Mordechai from the Shevet Binyamin. And Shaul, Shaul, is uh, Shaul, Shaul is the uh, first king that we had and uh, one day he dies one day Hashem sent the uh, prophet Samuel that was the prophet of that generation and he informed the Jewish nation that is mitzvah to eliminate the evil nation of Amalek yesterday my entire lecture was about Amalek should listen to understand what Amalek is and who are the Amalekim today, in today's generation. So he actually did the mitzvah 99.999%. What's wrong? If someone tells me, I want you to learn Torah to the best effort you can all day. Don't get up from the Gemara. Right after you pray Shachrit, sit and learn until midnight. Do not move. Don't move your, your, your face from the Gemara all day. So, okay. What happened if I sat from 7 in the morning until 1 a.m. 1 a. at night and I did not move my face from the Gemara except one time? One time someone called my name, I went like this, and right away I remember and I went back to the Gemara. Would you give me a hundred on my test, on my mission? Or you would give me 99, or 99.5, or 99.9. After all, I said from 7 until 1, 15, 16 hours of Torah. One second I move my head. So, if you had to test me if I should be accepted to the best yeshiva, meaning yeshiva of serious learners, that look would be enough for me to be disqualified? What do you think? Or oh, it's a pure cr cruelty to fail me on that look. If you the judge, you have to be in, in a place of Hashem right now. And you want to decide if I have the merit to go to a great yeshiva of hard-working learners that give their life for the Torah. Because I looked for one second to the side in 16 hours, one second I moved my head from the Gemara, one second. Would you disqualify me or no? 
You said, no, you're human. Baruch Hashem, you're human. People make mistakes. Baruch Hashem, it's only that. One second out of 16 hours, we take our head, our hat off for you. We bow down to you. Welcome to the greatest yeshiva. There's not that many like you, right? I would get compliments non-stop for weeks. So that's basically what Shaul did. He killed all the Amalekim except one. So Shaul did basically everything. He killed all of them except one. One he left. All of a sudden he had mercy on him. Agag, the king, which is 100% Amalek. Haman, what's his name in the Megillah? Haman, Agagi, meaning grandson of whom? Of Agag. Haman is a few hundred years after Agag. Meaning from Agag, a new nation started. They didn't kill Agag that particular time. I don't know how long it was, day, two days, a week. He made another woman pregnant. When Shmuel came and found out that they didn't kill the sheep and the king is still alive, he actually killed him, but it was too late already. Why? Because there was one Amaleki growing in someone's wound somewhere in the world and became again the whole nation of Amalek. Germany, the Nazis came from there. The empire of Germany, from that mistake. If Shaul would have killed Agag, just like he killed the rest of Amalek, he wouldn't have Haman, you wouldn't have the Holocaust, you wouldn't have Hitler, and you wouldn't have the Palestinians today, which is also part of Amalek. So much evil came to the world from having mercy on the king of Amalek, Agag. Now let me ask you a question. Shmuel is a righteous prophet? What do you think? The Torah says that he's equal like Moshe and Aaron combined. Hashem say Moshe is the greatest man ever lived, the most humble man ever lived. No one I love more than Moshe. I name my Torah after Moshe, Torah Moshe Avdi, Moshe. I call Moshe my faithful servant and hundreds of other compliments about Moshe in the Torah and hundreds of compliments about Aaron in the Torah, take all the compliments of Moshe, and all the compliments of Aaron, and all the love that Hashem had to these two brothers, put it on a scale, and put Shmuel alone on the other side, and he's greater than both of them combined. That's what the Gemara say, end of argument. Shmuel shakul ke Moshe ve Aaron. So Shmuel is... <laughs> Beyond words, right? So someone like that, would you accept him to take a sword and detach someone's head? It's a little bit hard, no? If it come to the chief rabbi of Brooklyn today, whoever he is, rabbi, we have a mission for you. There is Ichye Sinwar in Mach Shimo. We call him. We want to give you the honor. You take the sword and you take off his head, this Nazi monster who killed 1,500 children and women and citizens and civilians. We want to give you the honor. You, you execute him or you hang him. Something inside me says that 90% of the rabbis in the world would not run to get the job. It's not for me. I mean. Never killed a mosquito. You want me to chop someone's head off? But it's a very big mitzvah. So you're gonna get a, a great reward for it. Imagine you had a merit to hang Adolf Hitler in Machshimo, or to burn him alive, or Bin Laden. You should be honored for giving this, for getting that such a merit to execute such a monster and make the, the world a much better place. But the actual killing, it's not for me. I can slaughter a chicken, a little neck like this. Some blood comes out, I faint. I get a shot by the doctor, I faint. I can see a surgery. 
If I'll be in a surgery room, I'll faint. I, I, it's not for me. But it's mitzvah to kill him. If you don't kill him, he's going to go free. Find someone else to do it. Right or wrong? You know why? Because we are all selfish. What's the connection between selfishness and refusing to execute such a monster? No one ever said that it's a pleasant thing to do. If we really love Hashem and His children, we would feel so honored that we got the merit, we would run to do it. As much as we hate the transaction of killing some, oh my, I won't sleep for a week after that. But I know that's what Hashem wants, and I will run to do it. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what I prefer. It doesn't matter if I like it or hate it. It doesn't matter if a week after I'm going to have a trauma. None of the above I can care about. I only care what Hashem wants. That's what Hashem wants. I run to do it. Hashem doesn't want it. I will never do it. And that's what we are missing today. We first think about ourselves. If you would think about Hashem, if you would think about Hashem, you wouldn't care what you feel. It would not be relevant. Shmuel came, he knew Hashem said to erase the memory of Amalek, and right away he killed him. And he told him, the same way you kill so many innocent people, your sword kills so many miserable people and ruins so many families. This is what you're going to get for, for what you've done. But it was too late already. So the mercy that Shaul had on Agag caused millions of Jews to die. Millions died for having mercy on that monster. All the people that died in October 7, it's the fault 100% of the stupid Israeli government. They murdered them, not the Hamas. Don't let them fool you. Bibi and the rest of the idiots and the stupid lefty doctors of the hospitals in Israel who took care of this Sinoir monster that was already 90% dead with a growth in his brain. And the Israeli doctors fought to save that monster after, after he slaughtered people in jail with a razor knife. In the middle of the night, he went from one to the other and slaughtered their neck, killed them inside the, you know, Ziki. In the only way he comes out of jail if they exchange prisoners. He knew it. it other than that, there's no chance for him to come out. He murdered already people. So big terrorists. He's in jail for life. Until they kidnap an Israeli, they already know. So it doesn't matter whether he killed five in a jail or 5,000. It's not relevant. He will come out and they kidnap some Israeli. That's it. So it's nothing to be afraid of. He tried to kill anyone. Who did he kill? Palestinians that he suspected that they give information to Israel. Just suspected. Murder them all with cold blood. They see such a monster. You see another Hitler in front of your eyes. The Torah give permission to save his life? What kind of a normal person would come with such a stupid decision? You have cancer? Very good. We can't wait until you die. If it was up to us, we would choke you yesterday. Come on, help me out. I'm a human being. No, you're not. You're a monster. The faster you'll be dead, the better it is for many, many people around you. I will give an order to save your life? How stupid I could be, knowing that you declare that you won't rest until you slaughter all Jews. Who runs to save such a monster? Imagine in the United States if they catch Bin Laden alive after killing 3,000 people in September 11. And some lefty idiot Jew doctor would say on the news, I would love very much to operate on his head and save him. That would be the end of Jews in America. You won't be able to come out of your door ever again. The Americans will hate you a, a thousand times more than what they already do. Why you hate the Jews? You want to save Bin Laden after what they have done to us? They're right or wrong? 
we wouldn't be able to say a word. <laughs> They're right. They're right. How do you even offer such a thing? That's what they did. They saved him, and this is what we got. So who murdered 1,500 kids and raped all these girls? Bibi and the rest of his fools. That's their fault. And that's what Hashem is going to do for them. When they die, they're going to have to be judged for every victim of October 7. Maybe they did good things in their life as well. I don't know. But for that, no question that they're going to pay for the drop of every blood of that day. Don't get me wrong, if someone died, that means Hashem wrote it in his verdict in Rosh Hashanah. We know without Bibi. We know without the stupid Israeli doctors who gave their life to save this monster. We know without it, they would have to die. Even if they let Sinwar die, another monster would come and do it. Don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think that people decide who's going to die and who doesn't. Don't think that people decide that. Hashem first decide who would live this year and who will die. Now, remember what Hashem does after he created the world. The Gemara asks, what does God do since he created the world? Okay, everything is running now. The answer is a matchmaker. He's introducing individuals and matching between them. Husband and wife, two partners, a general and a soldier, two politicians to run together, a client and a lawyer, a sick person and a doctor, all these matchmaking, billions and trillions of them every day in the world, Hashem does. That's how he runs the world. Some poor man is looking where he's gonna, my salvation will, will come from. Another righteous person sitting now in Borough Park, he said, I have $1,000 maaser, 10% from my income this month. Who should I give it to? Who should I give it to? He's thinking, he comes out going to the, to the shul. He see the men over there. How are you? Who put them together? Hashem. How you been? Ah, it's been a tough month. I'm unemployed already for six months. My rent is coming tomorrow. I don't know what to do. How much you need? At least a thousand dollars to keep my landlord, you know, calm. Oh, Mishamayim. Just have an envelope here. Happy Purim. Who made the match? Now what happens if this person has a thousand dollars? He doesn't want to give it to him. For whatever reason. Then Hashem will give someone else. Someone else will give it to him. He must get it. The question is, will you grab the merit? No, somebody else will take it. That's how the world works. Somebody has to die this year. Hashem writes that in October 7 there will be a mass murder, massacre in Israel. And X amount of people will die and some will be kidnapped and horrible other things that happen. This was all written in Rosh Hashanah. What happened if the Hamas wouldn't be interested to perform the murder, the massacre? What happened? They decided not to do it. They chazru b'tshuva. They repented. They must die, these people, with or without Hamas. So then the jihad would do it. They don't do it. Hezbollah would do it. Hezbollah won't do it. An Arab Israeli will do it. There's so many ways to do it. None of them wants to do it. A lightning would come and kill 1,500 people in a, in a festival when they dance around Buddha on Shabbat, on Simchat Torah. Lightning. I saw one time a person walk on the street, a video. Lightning came, boom! Shh, you know what it is? Lightning is thousands or tens of thousands of volt. If you put your finger inside the, the, the outlet, you get electrocuted in Israel for 220 volt. 220 electrocute you, you die on the spot. Imagine 10,000 volt. 50,000 volt, lightning. Lightning, you know what lightning? You know the amount of electric? Fry you in less than a second. The same way it fired one person, can fry 1,500 in a second. Psh, boom, finished. Bottom line, what I'm saying is, if Hashem decided you'll die, don't worry, you'll have a way to find it, how to do it. If it has to be an easy, painful death, you'll get a cancer. 
If it has to be a fast death, terror attack, car accident, hurricane, tsunami, and many other ways. So, with BB, without BB, with the Israeli army, without Israel, with Hamas, without Hamas, with Iran, without Iran, all of that is the background. The decision were made and it must happen. If you need to make money, it must happen. If you need to lose money, it must happen. If you have to be sick, it must happen. Now what's the way to cancel those bad decrees? Now, let's give you examples. How do we cancel decrees? Not by kissing up to Biden or to the Democrats or hoping that Trump will save us. You know, even uh, waiting for the Mashiach, for the Messiah, for the wrong reason, it's also heresy. One of the 13 principles of Judaism is that the Mashiach would come. The Messiah has to come. And then there will be resurrection, resur res resurrection of the dead. So that's another principle, the last one. So now, if the Mashiach has to come, what is the reason that the Mashiach has to come? That's critical. I'll give you an example. One time an Israeli guy told me, Rabbi, Arav, yes, Matai kvar yavo Mashiach. You know when it was? Remember about 20 years ago when the Arabs were blowing buses in Tel Aviv every 20 minutes? Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, another bus exploded, and another one, the, the suicide bombers. They wear a coat, underneath they have the bomb, they go in a bus, boom! They blow up, 25 people died, 17 died, every 20 minutes! The Israelis didn't know what to do. Massive attack, suicide bombers one after the other, buses exploding, heads of people on the street, children are burning in the middle of the streets, it was a disaster. So it was a little bit similar to what we saw in October 7. Here it was a big, big amount. Over there it was an installment. 20, 15, 20, 25. This is how it was. So this guy came to me and said, Arab, matai kvar ha-Mashiach yavo? I said, why do you want Mashiach to come? To get rid of all this thirsty, bloodthirsty Arab. How, how, how long are they going to kill us? How much more? So I said to him, if I would be you, I would sit and read Tehillim all day that the Mashiach will not come. <laughs> Took him a few seconds. To... <laughs> Should come, you mean? No, no, that it shouldn't come. Why? I thought we want Mashiach to come. So yes, but not for the reasons you want. So he said, well, what do you mean? I said, I'll tell you what. When Mashiach comes, People like you that are not Shomer Shabbat will not survive a second. That's the biggest threat for you right now. If Mashiach come tomorrow, you're finished. You're done. The last thing you want is Mashiach to come. Because why Mashiach is coming? Letaken olam b'malchut shaday. To fix the world. And there's no way to fix the world before you clean all the dirt. And all the cancer. And all the wicked people. And all the heretics and all the enemies of God. Are you going to keep them around when Mashiach comes? Are you going to keep Bernie Sanders around and Chuck Schumer and the rest of the garbage of this world? How are they going to be in the same world with the holiest man that just got the Shechina of Hashem, the spirit of Hashem into him to come and purify the world? How are you going to leave these monsters who every minute of their life fought God and his Torah and Judaism and the rest of How are you going to keep them around? He first has to clean everything. So to hope that the Mashiach come to save us from the anti-Semite Nazis and Palestinians and the rest of all the, the monsters, that's not the reason. To say that the Mashiach would come to save us from our debt, from our bankruptcy, from our high bills, from our poverty, that's also not a good reason. So if somebody asks, okay, so what should I aim? I want Mashiach to come for what? For what? Only one intention you have to have. What is it? 
to bring the world back to the situation that the world was in it before the sins of Adam. Fixing the world, meaning it's bringing the world back to the original format. Just like you do restart in your computer. You know, restart usually solves 99% of the problem. 99, the, the computers is a very strange thing. One day you come, you want to put the password in your bank, you click on the keyboard, nothing happens. Or you have a window, you try to close it, you click on a red X, it's not going away. Restart, everything is unbelievable. You try to switch from English to Hebrew, it doesn't go. You click, click 20 times, doesn't go. What? Well, restart, everything works. This is what Mashiach is. Restart. Everything falls into place. No more wicked people, no more Nazis, no more Palestinian Amalekim, no more Bernie Sanders and other garbage people like him. They don't. You don't have them in the world. You have only righteous Gentiles and righteous Jews. Most likely there will be more Gentiles left than Jews. Because from 8 billion people, even if 1% of 1% of the Gentiles are righteous, you do the math. You have 8 billion goyim. 1% of 8 billion is how much? Huh? 80 million, 80 million goyim. That's 1%. 1% of 1%, 1% of 80 million, 800,000 righteous Gentiles. How many righteous Jews you have today in the world from 15 million Jews? If it will be 800,000, I will be dancing here in Coney Island Avenue a whole day for you, in the middle of the intersection. If now they would ask me, would you sign that 800,000 will survive when Mashiach come? I will be very happy. In order for us to survive, we need Torah and Gmilut Hasadim. Torah and Gmilut Hasadim. Most Jews don't learn Torah. Barely. So that's a big problem. Some do Hasadim. Is it enough? You have to have clean hands, not to be a thief. Not to have isure karet, not to make sins with girls, no homosexuality, no sins with animals, no looking at dirty things, no dirty, filthy internet on your phone or on your laptop, no TV in your house. Your wife has to be fully modest and your daughter, your children have to be in very good kosher yeshivot. Many yeshivot are not kosher. They are the exact opposite of what Hashem had in mind when he said yeshiva. So after all the obstacles, if you're going to have 800,000, then Hashem is very pleased with them. I'll be dancing in the street. No wonder Chazal said that heaven was made from the smallest letter, yud. Tiny dot, yud. Why? Because only very few make it there. Very few. So, if you have a few hundred thousand goyim, or a few millions of goyim that will survive. The good news is, well, it's, it's the pen if you can call it good or bad. I'll explain. If you go into a room, they give you one minute to grab as much as you can. Full of diamonds on the shelf. Lots of diamonds. But you have only 60 seconds. Quickly, quickly, you put in your pockets, in your mouth, you push in your ears, you put under your yarmulke, you stick it in your shoes, every pocket you can, you hold as much as you can, and you walk out, up, 60 seconds. Then you look inside, you see only took 10% of the amount of diamonds, 90% left in the room. Now, are you happy or you sad? You took 20%. 80% left in the room. Hey, let me take some more. Time is up. You happy or you sad? The answer is both. Very happy, you just became a billionaire. Right? 
You have a lot of diamonds. Each diamond is a million, half a million. Multiplied by a few hundreds of diamonds that you put in your pockets, in your mouth, under your kippah, in your shoes, you know. Some people would even swallow the diamonds. Whatever happened with the stomach later, we'll deal with that. <laughs> you know? So, in the end, you took 20% and you now worth a billion dollars. But, four billion are left inside the room. You happy or you sad? You happy for the billion, you sad for the four billion, right or wrong? That's the salvation of the Jewish nation, that story. It's written in the words of the prophets, En ga'alti etchem, acharit, kereshit. The last salvation when Mashiach come will be similar to the one you had in the Exodus of Egypt. Chazal says in the Gemara, 20% got saved from Egypt, 80% died there from the Jewish nation, 20% will be saved in the end, and 80% will die and would lose everything. So that's good news or bad news? It's good news, 20%, it's 3 million Jews. The bad news that 12 millions right now have no chance, right now. As the way you look at the world, you have 3 million Shomer Shabbat Jews all over the world, and 12 million not Shomer Shabbat. They have no chance whatsoever, Mechalelei Shabbat. From the 3 million, not all of them are righteous. Some of the people from my black list, they Shomer Shabbat, and they are the biggest Machti Arabim in the world. They're for sure not gonna, going to be saved. Hashem is going to hold them guilty for every person who became heretics because of them. So what's going to be? Some people from the Mechalelei Shabbat will have such difficult time before the end, like what just happened in October 7, you know how many hundreds of Israelis became Shomrei Shabbat just from that day? Hundreds. That without it, they will never consider to become Shomrei Shabbat. You have un uh, non-stop stories that people publish that since then they became Shomrei Shabbat. They realize the end is coming. Those people without October 7, if Mashiach come, will be finished. Now they just got back their chance. In the end, 20% will be saved. The question is, will we be there or no? We, the Shomrei Shabbat. Non Shomrei Shabbat is nothing to talk about. Don't let anyone fool you. I don't care who told you otherwise, it's a lie. Mechalel Shabbat, it's written 12 times in the Torah that it's a karet punishment, a cut from the soul. The soul being cut out of my nation, Hashem say. Hashem is not a liar. Once he say that, that's it. So the question now, some of this Mechalei Shabbat, mamash before the end, Hashem will have mercy on them to become Shomrei Shabbat. And they can get saved in the last second. The last second. Why? Maybe they did wonderful things. Maybe they give tzedakah. Or maybe they are children or grandchildren of very big tzaddikim that beg Hashem to give their grandchildren a chance to get saved. And Hashem cannot ignore the fact that you are a grandson of such holy tzaddik. If you came from the family of the Rambam or Rashi or the Ari Kadosh, or even rabbis that live, the Chazonish and other, Chazonish didn't have kids, but, but the other Gdole Olam, and you right now, Mechalel Shabbat, Hashem will have extra mercy on you, not for you, for your grandfather. Who can give me a proof in the Torah for what I just say? Why Lot and his family got saved from Sodom? It was very wicked. Only for Abraham. Hashem saved Lot from burning alive and his two daughters. His wife was also supposed to get saved. And his son-in-laws, two, two daughters, two son-in-law, Lot and his wife, six wicked people, six, are about to get saved, even though they deserve to die even more than the people of Sodom. But they are getting saved for Avraham Avinu, that he won't have a broken heart. So what do you see over here? 
Sometimes you have a chance to get saved, not thanks to you. Could be for your wife, for your husband, for your grandfather, for the Talmud Yeshiva that you support every month. For him. Why? Because when the Talmud Yeshiva will be saved, and he will find out that the person who gave him every month a thousand dollars and he was learning years thanks to that Rasha. The Rasha gave a thousand every month but made a, a lot of other sins. Wasn't Shomer Shabbat, eating not kosher, a non-Jewish non girlfriend. And who knows how much he stole. He has a huge list of crimes. But he gives every month to the Bachur Yeshiva. The Bachur Yeshiva would say to Hashem, I'm, I'm not so happy I saved. I, I got saved and the one sponsor my whole Torah didn't get saved. So Hashem will give him extra merit. Pushes him. Smack him. Shake him up. Wake up, you fool. That's Corona. That's October 7th, September 11th. This is the wake up call. Some woke up, some didn't. So... You know, once I told you a story about the Maharsha. The Maharsha lived 450 years ago. He, he did not stop learning ever. He didn't have time to cut his hair. Regular people, every month, they go to the barber, no? He didn't want to waste that hour to go and have a haircut. So his hair grew up uh, very, very long. What did he do? He tied his hair to the chandelier from the morning to the night. Non-stop, he was tied to the chandelier. Why? That whenever he falls asleep, the head falls, pulls the hair and wake him up. That's how he looked, the Maharsha. You see what he wrote on the Talmud? You want to faint. <laughs> Brain like this, you begin to shake. Five words, it takes you a week to understand. In five words, he wrote to you ten pages. Five words. This, this brains that you don't, no, 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 you don't understand something like this can exist. So the Maharsha, in his time, there was one person in town that he was wicked, very wicked Jew. One time he died. Everyone hated him. Back in those days, people knew the difference between righteous and wicked. They knew to love the righteous and to hate the wicked. Today is the other way around. People kiss up to the wicked, but they put down the righteous. So what happened? When, the, when that person died, they made a funeral and they brought him into center of town. People come to say goodbye, family. One Bachur Yeshiva passed by with his finger, hit him on his nose. He's dead already, meaning to make fun at him. Boom, he hit him like this on the nose. And other Bachurei Shiva started to laugh. Why? They despised this Rasha. Was not Shomer Shabbat, was not a good person. Finally, we got rid of him. That's how they looked at it. That night, the Bachurei Shiva goes to bed. Who comes to him in a dream? Fuming. That Rasha that died. He sees him in his, in his dream. He says, shame on you. I will not rest until I kill you for what you've done to me. You embarrass me in front of the whole people in a funeral. I will not rest until I take you from this world. So the, uh, the Bachur Yeshiva told him, why are you so angry? You were dead anyway. He said, because everyone laughed and you embarrassed me. The shame was too much to bear. He woke up, he thought, ah, maybe I have it because of what happened today. Next day, he goes to sleep. Again, he comes. He falls asleep in the middle of the day in yeshiva, he comes to him in a dream. Every, as soon as he falls asleep, the guy shows up. He doesn't know what to do. He so, says, wow, he's not going to leave me alone. He so, go to the Maharsha, ask him. The biggest rabbi now in Europe, go ask him. He went to him, Rabbi, this is what happened. The Maharsha told him something doesn't add up here. It doesn't make sense. It's against the rules. How will Hashem allow such a wicked person 
to come back and distract a person that learned Torah every day all his life. How can it be? It doesn't add up. It's against everything that it's written. I have to come sleep next to you. Next time he comes to bother you, his spirit, I'm going to ask him, talk to me. Tell me what's your problem. They go to sleep. He comes again. Hope the Marsha say, if you hear, please talk to me. Leave him alone. Speak to me. Whatever problem you have, you, you come to me. I don't know how exactly he communicated with him when they went to sleep. He came to him in a dream. He asked him, why you want to kill him? Because of what he did to me in a funeral. The Marsha said to him, okay, what he did to you was wrong. You should have not done it. But he's a young guy. He did something stupid. But for that, you want him to die? Say yes, I will not rest until I have revenge. He said to him, but can you explain to me how you got permission to come so many times to disturb him when everybody knows that you are such a wicked person in this town? Everybody knew about you. That you are a shamerusha. So how you get permission to disturb a Bachur Yeshiva who sits all day and learns Torah? He said to him, Rabbi, there's no secret that I was wicked as you describe. It's true. I cannot deny it. But there was one great thing I did who gave me a lot of merit in, the, in my court, in my, uh, in my sentence. What did you do? So one time I walked on a bridge by the lake. And I heard someone is screaming. I looked down. And I saw someone is drowning. I jumped with my suit into the water. I grabbed the guy. I took him out and saved his life. Didn't know how to swim. Another minute, he will be dead. When I took him out, as he's now relaxing, we started to talk. And I found out that he's a Bachur Yeshiva. He's learning in Yeshiva and he's very poor. So, as we became like close now, because I just saved his life, I realized he doesn't have a penny, so I started to send him every month 200 ruble. 450 years ago was a lot of money. Let's say like a few hundred dollars today. So I started to send him every month 200 ruble. When I came to my court date, the prosecutor were reading all my scenes, endless amount of scenes, endless. They didn't know where to hide from the embarrassment. But then one angel came and he said that he object that I have millions of mitzvot. I thought for a minute that it's, they made a mistake. I, I don't have one mitzvah. Where do they have millions of mitzvot that I have? And that's when he presented that I'm supporting this Bachur Yeshiva. And that Bachur Yeshiva created for me millions of mitzvot. So now, it's not so simple. As wicked as I am, but I have a lot of merit. So they ask me, what would you like to do? I say, I want to punish the guy that embarrassed me. Wow. <laughs> That's what he has in his mind. You know, an hour ago, before the lecture, I heard an unbelievable story. There was one guy, Kafkazi, poor guy, became a drug addict. He was a nice person, but he was heavy into drugs and he died. The drugs killed him. One person said, I went to a place, I see my cousin is talking to an older man. And the older man say, no matter what, I'm not forgiving him. The guy said to him, but he died. He cannot come back and pay you back your $50. The drug addict borrowed $50 from this older man and died. He never paid it back. The old man saw that he died from drugs, the poor guy. Poor guy, miserable guy. Drugs killed him. Young. What's on his mind? Fifty dollars. He doesn't forgive fifty dollars. <laughs> so the guy said to me, I went out quickly. I took fifty dollars here. 
take your fifty dollars, say that you forgive him. Say, Machul. He say even when he got the fifty dollars, it still was hard for him to say that he forgive this junkie guy that died. Look how stupid and evil people are in this world. Fifty dollars from someone who died miserable like this. He has no heart to forgive. Fifty dollars, can you believe that? Two cups of coffee, it's fifty dollars today. He doesn't forgive. What's waiting for this Rasha when he comes to his trial? What's waiting for him? If it's such a low life that someone died so miserable and he owed him fifty dollars, the first thing he, he, he should have said, I forgive you the fifty dollars, I don't want you Chas Shalom to have more punishments for taking money from me. That's the first thing a normal person would say, even a non Jew would say that. If you have a heart. What does he say? I don't forgive him. Believe such thing? Fifty dollars, you sure? Maybe fifty thousand dollars. Fifty dollars. Doesn't forgive him. So the Maharsha said to him, I don't get it. So because of that, that you gave 200 rubles to this guy, they gave you permission now to come? Say yes. Say, okay, let me tell you the trick here. They're fooling you. They want you to come and say that you want to kill this guy. <coughs> why they let you come and bother him? Do you know why? The Satan, the prosecutor, is trying to prove that you don't care about Torah. You give 200 rubles to this guy, but just because he's poor, not because he's a learner of Torah. And what's going to be the proof? That because uh, someone that learns Torah gave you a little smack on your nose, you're willing to kill him, you're willing that all the Torah that he learns will go down the drain for the next few years, just for your ego. That shows that you don't care about Torah. Once he dies, you are done. Because all the merit that you have from the Torah you supported will all vanish. Because right now, your defender, defense, defense angel, is using all these millions of, of mitzvot of the Torah to save you from a horrible verdict. But when you come and kill Bachur Yeshiva for something so stupid, it shows that the Torah means nothing for you. You would give him the money regardless of Torah, not Torah. You would lose all your merit. Forgive him. Go back and tell them, I don't want any problem with this guy. Why? He's learning Torah. For that, I forgive him. Yes, he insulted me. A mochel. That's for your own good, not for him, for your own good. And after that, he never came back. This Rasha never came back. At least he was smart to get the point. This, I read this story in one of the books. This was 450 years ago. Now, Rabotai, listen carefully, listen. So King Saul was a righteous king from the family of Mordechai, Ish Yemini. When he died, they did not make the proper eulogy for him. They made a eulogy, but it was hard for them to praise him. Why it was hard? He had, like I say, he had not such a clean record. Mordechai came from him, obviously. Mordechai is behind Mordechai, no, the Gemara say, why Mordechai and Esther came from Shaul? Because of the modesty that Shaul had, the Gemara say. Shaul was very modest as a man, meaning watching his eyes, not talking to women, dressed, cover 100% like the Babasali was. Because he was such a modest person, in modesty, Mordechai and Esther came from his genealogy, from his descendants. So Rabotai, listen carefully. So Shaul, they didn't make a proper eulogy for him. They made a eulogy. They said a lot of the good things he did. But because he killed 85 Kohanim in the city of Nov, because he chased David Amelech, 
when the women seeing that Shaul killed thousands, but David killed tens of thousands, he got jealous. There was some incidents with him. You know, I mean, as righteous as you are, no one is God, yeah? So there was a sour taste in this eulogy. Listen, listen, Rabotai, listen, this is very important what, I, what I'm about to read to you. And he, and he got buried where? In Yavesh Gilad, in a property called Yavesh Gilad. Be'ever Yarden Mizrahi, they buried him on the other side of the Jordan River, what called today Jordan, right? Bechipazon, in a rush, they buried him in a rush. Now, Rabotai, after the funeral of Shaul, there are two years of hunger, two years starvation. David is wondering, people are righteous. Everyone is religious. Why Hashem gave us such a pandemic? No rain, no wheat, no barley, nothing to eat. People are hungry, walking around every day, hoping to find something to eat. What did David do? Sha'al ba'orim uvatumim. The Kohen have a special board with 12 stones. You ask questions and the stones begin to shine. Why there is a hunger in the land? What was the answer from Shamaim? Because Shaul did not get a proper eulogy according to his honor. And for another reason. Why? That Shaul that did not get the proper eulogy killed 85 holy Kohanim in the city of Nov. Where is Nov, do you know, today in Israel? Givat Zev. You know Givat Zev? Next to Ramot, across the street, there is a neighborhood Ar Shmuel. Givat Zev, and right behind it, between them and the Arabs, there is a huge property. They have vineyards there, fields. That's right there. From there you see the grave of Samuel the prophet. That's where David was, that's where Shaul was. That's all the stories of the Tanakh are right there. Mamash attached to Jerusalem. So the, ans the second answer is, Ve'al bet adamim, for the bloodshed. What bloodshed? That Shaul killed the Kohanim, 85 holy Kohanim. The Gemara say each one of them was worthy to become the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Why Shaul killed them? Because bad people came and instigate between Shaul and them. They came and say they rebel against you. You the king, but they helping David. You are chasing David and they helping him. It's against the law. You the king. They mordim ba malchut. They deserve execution. And he was convinced that according to the Torah they do. He went and killed 85 Kohanim. Holy Kohanim. And also he killed the Kohen Gadol. And that's what the reason that he died. Because killing the Kohen Gadol, he got Mida Keneged Mida. Kohen Gadol and a king. They are in the highest level. One for one. And there were seven Givonim, converts, non-Jews that adopted themselves into the Jewish nation. And they used to supply food to the city of Nov. Every day they bring a big carriage with food. They sell whatever they sell, vegetables, food. That was their parnasah. That's how they make a living. Because Shaul killed 85 Kohanim, their parnasah went down. They used to sell to 85 families. They don't have customers anymore. Their money, income went down. And they were very angry. Now when David found out of what happened, he went to them to cheer them up. To those seven Givonim that called themselves Jews. But they refused. 
They say, seven of us suffer, we will only forgive Shaul if we kill seven of his children and grandchildren. Eye for an eye. He hurt us, we are seven people, seven families, we have to kill seven of his children, grandchildren. David said, I decreed that none of you are Jewish. No one will marry you, no one will ever take you as Jews. Why? Because the Jews have three signs. Merciful, shy, and kind. And you have none of the above. You're cruel. You don't care to hear stuff. people suffer, there's hunger, people starving, children starving, people in yeshiva don't have what to eat. Families are suffering, they have nothing to do with that. The whole land is hunger. And you are not willing to forgive, you are cruel, you are definitely not kind and you have no shame. Impossible to count you as Jews. So remember about time, when you see someone today, cruel cannot be Jewish. Not generous, not kind, not wanting to help, cannot be Jewish has no shame acting in horrible movies, no clothes, curses, okay. How the people behave, you cannot believe it. Check his grand-grandmother. You're gonna have a big surprise. A person that has a Jewish soul can never be cruel can never be arrogant like that with no shame and can never ever be the opposite of kind. See a, a, a hungry person not run to give him food. See a person needs a right, doesn't care, let him stay in a cold place without giving him a right. It cannot be. Those are the three signs. You know how they have a questionnaire? Test yourself. <laughs> they give you questions. And then in the end they give you a mark. You know those games? Check yourself up. I can add a few more uh, questions. Check if you're grateful or you are ungrateful. Someone did a favor to you, you appreciate? For the rest of your life? Or after a minute you forgot? That's also a very bad sign. Your ego is flying to the roof, full of ego. Show of ego, attention everywhere. It's not good. Bottom line, there's a list of things, Rabotai. So, no one is allowed to marry them, David made a decree. Isolated them completely. This is the story. What did we learn from the story? What did we learn from the story, Rabotai? What did you learn from this story? There's a reason why I told you this story. The answer is how dangerous it is to hurt the parnasa of another person. These, they were not Jewish. Fake converts. They were cruel. They were wicked. They were murderers. They want to murder innocent grandchildren of Shaul. What do they have to do with that? Bottom line, they are Hamas Palestinians, these Givonim. That's what they are. You heard their Parnassah. Three years hunger all over Israel. <laughs> Imagine you heard the parnassah of a righteous Jew, of righteous Bachur Yeshiva, of a righteous rabbi. What's waiting for you? Three years everyone starve. That's one thing you learn from the story. And second, sometimes you see a righteous person all his life was righteous, but one bad thing happened with him, one or two. I mean, no one is an angel. Could be a severe thing. Wow, did you hear what he did? 
I'm done with him. Don't want anything to do with him anymore. Don't mention the name here anymore. Right away we rush to judge, no? To disqualify, to ban. Because of that, when they say the eulogy for Shaul, it wasn't with the entire heart. Saying a eulogy on someone that was your friend all your life, but he did one or two bad things to you. As a result of that, in a, in a eulogy, you don't put all your heart into it. Because of that, there was hunger all over the land. All over the land, everyone starving, why? For disrespecting the Chacham. Disrespecting the Chacham. Three years of hunger. Three years of hunger. Why? You are the Parnasa of this Reshaim. If it would be Tzadikim, it could be 30 years of hunger. Could be much more problems than that. What else do we learn from something like this? Everything Hashem does is midah keneged midah. I'll give you a, an example. The Gemara say, Arabim, someone that influenced the public to commit sins. Hakadosh Baruch Hu miyaches elav et kol achataim sharabim asu michamato. All the sins that people committed because of him, all goes to his account. Where do we learn it from? Masechet Avot. Yerov Am chata v'ichti et arabim, chet arabim talui bo. Yerov Am ben Navat puts idols for people not to go to Jerusalem because of his ego. All the idol worshipping of the entire nation goes to his account. Because he was the reason for them worshipping the, those idols, all the individual sins goes to his account. Where is it written clearly? The book of King A, chapter 15, verse 30. Elachim Aleph. Al chatot Yerovam asher chata v'asher ichti et Yisrael. It's not only paying for what he committed, the sins that he committed, for the sins that the nation of Israel committed, is also paying. It's a clear verse. Clear verse. It's not open for debate. Lo neemar al chatot Yerovam ve'Yisrael. אלא על חטות ירובם אשר חטא ואשר יחטי את ישראל. Meaning he's responsible for all their sins. One thing, and I want to finish here. It says, you went somewhere. You're on a business trip. I don't know. You went to India, Thailand, Nepal, Japan. I don't know where. <laughs> Let's say that over there, you don't have too many people to teach you Torah. You ask where there is a synagogue, they sent you to some place. You see, the rabbi over there has a long ponytail. What can you expect from a rabbi with a ponytail? Depends if you're stupid or not. If you're stupid, you don't see the problem. So the question now, how does the halacha 
looks at someone that goes to learn Torah from someone that is wicked. Let's see, you go to learn Torah from the clown from Englewood, Imach Shimo. You go to listen to him. He, he has a show somewhere, and you listen to it. The clown from Minnesota, he gives a shiur, and you sit and watch. The clown from Boca Raton, he gives a shiur, and you listen to I heard that there's a kosher organization who just made an interview with him, a video. Terrible. Ech naflu giborim. You fill up the bucket, you bring a lot of kosher interviews, then you make one, boom, knock down everything. You lose everything. You promote Torah from such a picosim? Someone who brings a Christian missionary into a shul, you let him, you make a video with him and publish it, publish it in a kosher page? should know, I don't know which one is worse. I'll ask you, you tell me your opinion. A person did two horrible things. One, A, he brought a Christian missionary who said that you have to pray for the soul of Hitler and, you, and he is declaring that he give his life for JC. He won't rest until he bring everyone to be a follower of JC. And he's a missionary, meaning he promotes idol worshipping, to bring him into your synagogue to speak to the community, to give them motivation. Motivation for what? That maybe they should go to the church on next Sunday to continue to hear some motivation. That's one sin. Now there is another sin. Tell me which one of them is worse. There is one woman in a Jewish world. If you have to ask, who is the most wicked woman in the history of the Jewish nation? The answer is her. What's her name? Dr. Ruth, Imach Shima Vezichra. But I have to say her name. No one is more responsible for cheating, for all kinds of abomination, horrible programs that she made convinced thousands and thousands of people to cheat on their wives, on their husband, to change partners, to watch dirty films, to excite their love life by putting filth into the house. Birkitsur, the number one machtiat arabim in the last 60 years. No one is like her. To bring her, making her sit in a synagogue next to the holy Torah in front of the community and kiss up to her for an hour and a half like she's minimum the Chazonish. So Dr. Ruth, <laughs> wow, it's fascinating. Your life story. Which one of the two is the biggest crime? Which one? Both. Oh, the missionary. It's hard, right? He have done both the clown from Boca Raton. And he's on a magazine that you buy here in Shabbat. Those religious magazines. They have every week. He's publishing worth of uh, tiflut over there. And now this poor guy is the organization. They just made a video with him. They don't know who he is. They don't know. I'm sure they didn't have it in mind. Maybe they're not aware who is the person he is. What's now, what's now the verdict here? Well, let me read it to you. Don't say I make up things, okay? I, I, I talk with sources. There is a dean. Asur lilmo Torah minaminim. You're not allowed to learn Torah from the Minim. What happens if you cannot find a kosher teacher? There's no kosher teacher. Mm -hmm. 
You have books. You don't know who wrote the books. Maybe kosher riders, maybe not kosher riders. There's one very famous rabbi that wrote big amount of books, I believe. I've seen many of them. Very popular in the Orthodox world. And uh, you cannot count him in a minyan. If he comes into the shul on Yom Kippur, you're not allowed to take out the Torah. Why? There is an interview between him and an atheist in England. The atheist asks him, what about Adam and Eve? Did Adam and Eve really live? They really existed? Or it's a parable? Star, mashal, parable, a story, fairy tale. He say it's a parable. It's a parable. He said to him, what about the exodus of Egypt? What about the exodus of Egypt? Did it happen? Oh, it's also a parable. He said, also a parable. This is a, the former chief rabbi of England. It's very famous in every synagogue here in Brooklyn. He has his books. Don't say I don't warn you. So, he said, also a parable. So the Rasha Merusha, the guy that interviewed him, said to him, how do we know which parts of the Torah are real and which parts of the Torah are parable? If some of them you say yourself, that never happened, right? There was no exodus of Egypt. There was no Adam and Eve. So you know what he answered to him? He said, everything that is written in the Torah that does not comply with what science discover, it's a parable. Zucks. Jonathan Zucks. You don't believe me, I'll send you the video. I send it to hundreds of people who question me. I have a very good friend, he almost killed me because he was a personal friend of him. I know. But a personal friend of mine, he was a personal friend of mine went so crazy when, I, when he heard me saying it. But the minute I sent him the video, he said to me, I'm, I'm beyond shocked. First, I apologize to you that I question you. Who would ever believe such thing? A video, not someone told you that he spoke to him, a video. He said there was no Adam and Eve, it's a parable. So maybe the whole Torah is nothing. According to him, the Torah is a toilet paper. That's basically what it is. It's just fairy tales. And you know how they honored him in his life when he was alive? One thing I should say to him, if you're allowed to defend him, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a little bit problematic, that he had very, very nice manners. He was a very nice, polite person. He wasn't an arrogant animal like the rest of the guys in my list. At least he was a gentleman. Does it help? I don't know. But when someone comes and says to you there was no exodus of Egypt, do you ask him more questions about Torah? You ask him to send you his Dvar Torah? The question is, what do we do now? We do not know who wrote the book. I don't know. I have, I have 5,000 questions about what he said to him. If I could ask him, he's no longer alive. I know. I, you know what? I, I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know what to answer you. I mean, usually when someone says something, I try to find the logic. Why would he say that? Why would you say that? Are, now you're sitting in the night of Seder, Pesach. You, you talk about the whole Exodus of Egypt. You read the same Agada that I read. When I read the Agada, I leave the moment. Like we're just coming out of Egypt quickly, there's no time. I'm trying to be there, imagining myself carrying the, the door on my head and the children next to me and the ocean opens up. What was on his mind to say to this Apicores that it's just a parable? So you learn it like it's a Hollywood movie. Just like you watch a movie and you know it's fiction, but you're into it. It excites you. You even cry. You get excited. You get scared. But in the end, you remember it was just a movie. Ah, I wasted two hours on it. I guess that's how we learned the Agada. I don't know what to tell you. 
I don't know. Is he in hell? I don't know. I hope not. I hope not. I don't wish anybody to go to hell. I don't wish anyone to be punished. I hope people will repent. That's, that's our job, to try to make people repent, that they won't have suffering later on. Are we successful in everyone? No, of course not. There's no 100% success. But I know that some of you are asking, it's impossible, right? I could play it to you right now. But if you still question it, just email me, ravemizrachi.gmail.com, and I will send you the video. I send it to many, many people. All of them got the shock of their life. Some of them were big fans. Then, they, then you know what's the next question? Am I allowed to keep his books in my house? That's the next question. And that's problematic because now you have to start thinking about all the halachot. Let me read you one halacha. One halacha. Bedin, she'asur l'ilmod Torah mi'aminim. Now I have to learn Torah from people that contradict the principle of the Torah. What happens if you don't find Melamed Yeresh Amayim? You have a modern Orthodox teacher. It's not exactly tzaddik. See, his lifestyle. You see his level of modesty. You see the TV in his house. You see things that he does. Not exactly comply with halacha. But he knows how to teach. He can teach you now the laws of, uh, of uh, Lashon Ara by the Chafetz Chaim. He will know how to translate it to English. So you get the point from the Chafetz Chaim. But it's from his mouth. From his mouth. But what you read, what you read is what the Chafetz Chaim, the holy, the holy Chafetz Chaim wrote it. But someone like one of those clowns is reading it in his shiur. What does it count like? You're learning from the Chafetz Chaim or you learn from the clown in Englewood? Who do you learn it from right now? You hear the question or no? When I read to you now Rambam, do you learn Torah from me or you learn Torah from the Rambam? Who, who am I? I'm just the delivery guy, the, the mailman. You got a check from your uncle. I'm the mailman, I handed it to you. Who gave you the money, me or your uncle? Uncle. Uncle. Do I deserve some credit? If you say yes, then I deserve also a punishment when I bring you an audit letter from the IRS. When I bring you that letter, you want to curse me and beat me up, look what you've brought me now. So what do you want from me? I'm just doing my job, I'm a mailman. I feel very bad for you. What would be better, that I won't give it to you? I throw it somewhere and you'll find out by the time it's too late to prepare? So do I deserve a punishment if I brought you a bad news uh, as a mailman? No. I deserve any punishment or no? No. Maybe yes. Don't we have a same galgelim chova al yedeh chayav? Mailman that gives you bad news and the next day gives you good news. One day he gives you good news, the next day he gives you bad news. My question to you is, how is it possible that sometimes he will be a messenger for good things and sometimes a messenger for bad things? How can it be? We have a say. If you are kosher, you're in the hand of Hashem. Hashem uses you for good things. If you're not kosher, Hashem transfers you to the Satan. And the Satan is using you for bad things. If you're a mailman, who you belong to? To Hashem or to the Satan? <laughs> Good question, no? Ma, one hour you work for Hashem, one hour you work for the Satan? It's all from Hashem. The answer, all the mail you get, who really sends it? Hashem. Hashem. There's no Satan here. It's 100% Hashem. You get an invitation to go to court. Hashem arranged it for you on Rosh Hashanah. He delivered Hashem message. You got a big check of donation. Hashem arranged it on Rosh Hashanah. 
So whether he gives you good news, whether he gives you bad news, he's serving who? Hashem. You can question it. What happens if he brings you a bad, bad magazine? You pull it out from the mailbox, a picture of a not modest woman there. Who sent it to you, Hashem or the Satan? Maybe Hashem is testing you to see if you move your head from the page or no. And right away dump it to the thing. Or you open to see some other things inside. Who gave you this test? Huh? <laughs> if we don't know Aleph Bet of life, we have a very big problem here. You hear the question or no? Well, let me finish the halacha, wait. No, what do you think? That? <laughs> Hashem does everything? So the Satan doesn't have permission to give you a test unless Hashem approves it first. Yeah. I can show you sources that it's not like that. I mean, what you say, it's perfectly makes sense. I mean, it's very logical. But with sources, you cannot argue that the Satan initiate an attack on people based on his own opinion. And Hashem agreed, meaning the Satan's idea was to attack Yov. It wasn't Hashem's idea, based on the Midrash, on the Gemara. Hashem said, hey, there's no one like Avraham Avinu. Hashem said, no, it's Yov, Yov. Oh, let me go test him. Hashem said, yeah, but you cannot kill him. You can test him, you can do whatever you want. What, what is it, independent? So, Rabotai, the Maharal writes, Asur lilmod mirav sheno agun. You're not allowed to learn from a reform rabbi, conservative, or one that twists the Torah and teach the opposites of what's written. He tells the wicked, Hashem loves you. Someone like that modified the Torah. As we learn in the Gemara that Rabbi Meir had a rabbi. What was his name? Acher. Acher, like a stranger. But that wasn't his name, that was his nickname. What was his real name? Elisha ben Avuya. It was a huge Talmud Chacham. A rabbi of Rabbi Meir, and he became. became some kind of a reform. His Ashkafa has now problems. What happened to him? He went to the University of Manhattan. Few years he sat over there, next to the gay club there, and became not exactly as he used to be. His mind started to shift. Until the Chachamim say, is no longer one of us. That's it, Rasha. Acher, don't want to say his name. You're not supposed to say the name of a wicked person. People ask me, why you don't say the names of these people on your list? You're not allowed to say their names. When you mention their name, these Rashaim, right away, their bad energy affects you. That's why I call J.C. Penny. I don't say his name the way they say it. That's why I call him Santa Claus. That's why I call uh, the clown from Englewood. Don't want to say their names, their filthy names. I don't want to say on my lips their names. Yeah, but we need to know. So, you know, the people already know, basically. Those who follow me for years, they know already who the people on the list. Now the question is, how Rabbi Meir was learning from Elisha ben Avuya? He answered, because I know how to take the good out of the bad. Meaning, I'm already an experienced student, learned so many years. When I hear that he says something that is authentic, I grab it. Once he starts with his nonsense, I throw it out. Like a pomegranate. I know how to take the red seeds and throw the white garbage to the garbage. Can we say the same thing? Let me listen to Santa. After all, if he's going to give a one-hour speech, at least half an hour will be according to what's written, no? He reads a pasuk from the Torah. He reads. Mm -hmm. 
No, okay, that's, this pasuk is authentic. He read uh, maybe Alakha or the words of Rashi or something he saw in a Gemara. Okay, that part I will take. When he begins with this garbage, Hashem needs us, Hashem is a needy, he has no right to tell us what to do. I know it's all heresy. I avoid it. Or I fast forward. Why would you do such thing? There's not enough kosher speakers in the world that you can learn from them only good things. Why learning good and bad mix? Comes the bad and destroy the good. So let's assume there's no one else. You're on an island. You are on the same flight with one of those clowns. The plane landed in an island in Zimbabwe. You come out, everyone is dead besides you and Santa. He comes and says, let's learn. Let's learn Hevruta. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a big question. You allowed to learn with him? I said, oh, I'm not even allowed to speak to you. You already know the heresy on his mind and the nonsense he brings out on his mouth. That's the good, that's the good question. Huh? Learn Hilchot Shuvah. That's a good point. Maybe we should start with that. The Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, page 15, the Gemara says, Ma'i dikhtiv, ki siftei kohen yishmeru da'at, ותורה יבקשו מפיהו. What is it that it's written? The lips of a Kohen will observe, will reserve the dot, the pure knowledge. ותורה יבקשו מפיהו. He should request Torah from his mouth, from that holy man. כי מלאך השם צבאות הוא. It's written in Malachi 2, verse 7. This is the angel of God, this Chacham, who teach pure Torah. Im domei arav lemalach Hashem tzvaot, yevakshu Torah mipiu. If you see that he looks like an angel, behave like an angel, teach pure Torah, run to demand more Torah from his mouth. Ve'im lav, and if not, al yevakshu Torah mipiu. Do not want any Torah from his mouth. We have to ask, why did Chazal use the word Mipiu twice? It's unnecessary. One time we got the point. Chazal says, Ask for Torah from his mouth. And if he's not, don't ask for Torah from his mouth. We got the point. Why do you need to repeat it again? If he is an angel of Hashem, he's pure, he's holy, behave like an angel, tzaddik, run to ask Torah from his mouth. That's it. I got the point. <laughs> Meaning if he's not one of that, I don't have to learn Torah from him. But you know what? To make sure, and if he's not tzaddik and an angel and that, don't. Don't have to say, don't ask Torah from his mouth. We got the point. So it's like, ah. The answer, Abotai. Why the prophet Malachi, Malachi, used this word and didn't say Mimeno? Ask Torah from him. Why do you have to say from his mouth? Why the highlight is on the mouth? We know Torah comes from the mouth. When you come and say, I went to learn from him. You don't have to say, I learned from the Mount of Rav Yashiv. I learned from Rav Yashiv. I learned from Rav Sternburg. No, I learned from the Mount of Rav Sternburg. I didn't know it. Why you have to tell me from the Mount, from the Mount? What's the highlight here? The lesson here is, the severe sin is if you hear it coming from his mouth directly into your ear. It's the highest level of a sin. You look at his face. You look at his wicked face. You look at his movements. 
and makes a, and makes a huge damage to your soul. But if you read it somewhere that he wrote, the damage is not as big. Because you didn't hear his actual voice going into your, into your ear. It's a lower level of damage. That's why Chazal always used the word, mipume, mipume, from his mouth, from his mouth. So now comes the question. So how did Rabbi Meir learn Torah from the mouth of Elisha ben Avuya? Acher. Meaning from the question that Chazal is asking about Rabbi Meir, their problem was that he actually heard his real voice. But they will he if they would hear a student that heard it from him, it wouldn't be such a big deal. They wouldn't ask. What's the problem of Chazal with Rabbi Meir? How did you dare to actually hear Torah from such a heretic like Elisha ben Avuya? Even though he knew the whole Torah. You know what got him to become a kofer? You know the story or no? He reached such a high level, he went up to Shamaim and got a spiritual damaged. Whatever that means. Because he looked, he looked It's above our understanding. The Gemara says, four went up there, only Rabbi Akiva survived. May we never have tests like this. <laughs> we go up to Shamaim and get confused. I want to finish, Mamash finish, with your permission. I will read to you one more paragraph and we finish here for today. Matzdik Rasha, this is Proverbs 17, 15. That's the source. Matzdik Rasha, someone who justified a wicked person. Umarshia Tzadik, unjustify a righteous person. Toavat Hashem, Gam Shneem. Both cases, whoever does such thing is an abomination in the eyes of Hashem. When you defend any one of those clowns, you are abomination in the eyes of God. Even if you are Shomer Shabbat and you have a nice beard. And it's it that touching the floor when you walk in Boro Park. You defend the, those Rishayim, you are Toevat Hashem. When someone scream against, someone try to, to protect the people from not falling in their mouth, instead of saying he's right, he's trying to save the Torah from what's left, He's an extremist. Don't go. That's not the right way. You should accept everyone. You know these people? There are thousands of them living across the streets here. That's how they talk. Remember the story with the teacher, the girl, the American girl, yeah. that she was in a, working for one yeshiva here somewhere in Brooklyn. I don't know which yeshiva. And... Uh, they put the gay, the comedian gay, that lives with a husband, openly. He comes, make, imitates Faradim, imitates Ashkenazim, make fun at how they read. Tell jokes. And they put it on a group of the yeshiva, of the parents. And this righteous girl, she said, I'm sorry, but you cannot put anything from this person. He's living in an abomination against Hashem and... <laughs> Openly, with no shame. You have to see how they attacked her. In the end, they fired her. She came to say, and I'll have to publish a gay like this in a group of a WhatsApp group of parents from yeshiva. She's 100% right. That's what Hashem said to do. To condemn these wicked people. And not to tolerate what they do, even by a bit. Not to defend them in any possible way. If you do it, you are wicked. So instead of telling her, we apologize, you're right, it was a mistake in our judgment, they told her, what are you doing? 
You're making parents not wanting to send their kids to our yeshiva. You're making us lose money. <laughs> they fired her. This is the religious world of today. 2024, Leminiana. Those who does the best thing are condemned by all the modern orthodox and all the fakers. Those who speak lies and heresy, they are the hero of the community. You see them on the cover of the magazines for Shabbat. Olam afuch raiti. That's why the Gemara said that before the Mashiach would come, it will be almost impossible to find the truth. Everyone with another nonsense. This one, that one. Shem So let me read to you. Don't say I say it, I'm reading it to you. It's written in Proverbs 40, uh, 24, verse 24. It's another source. In Mishlei. Omer la rashat tzadikata. Someone that say to a wicked person, you are tzadik, you're righteous. Ikvu amim. Should be put to death by the nations, by the Nazis, by the Hamas. Ikvu amim. What does it mean they tell him you're righteous? They have a friend, it's Mechalel Shabbat. He wrote a check to the shul or to the yeshiva or he bought aliyah. Wicked people sometimes do good things. Not everything they do is wicked. There's no such thing. The worst monsters in the world, you can find a few hundred good things they did in their lifetime. No matter who you want. Even the Gemara says, Achav did a few good things. Yerovam did a few good things. Even though they were the most wicked people, but they did a few good things. Gemara discuss it. So, you come to a wicked person, you give him a compliment, you jeopardize your life. Ma, come on, don't be fanatic. I wanted to encourage him to do more good things. He gave a check to the shul. If I won't give him now a compliment, how will I be mekarev him? How will I make him bal tshuva? So it's a conflict. The biggest mitzvah is to make bal tshuva. The worst sin is to compliment the wicked. How does it go together? If you do that, or that, it's the opposite. No contradiction. On the side that no one is around, come and talk to him words of encouragement. Shal koach. I'm happy to see that you did a donation to the shul today. I want to give you a blessing that only good things will come from you. Bezrat Hashem, you'll be a very big tzaddik. And Hashem will help you to do tshuva. Words of encouragement. Can I offer you a CD or a book or a USB? Can you download this app and start listening to the speaker? Here you go. You didn't make Chilul Hashem in front of the whole community. But in front of people, you're not allowed to give him any compliment, even when he fulfilled a wonderful mitzvah. Where is the source? Orchot Tzadikim, chapter 24. Way of the Righteous, chapter 24, it's Hanufa, kissing up. Kissing up. You have an idol worshiper working with you. He did something good. You compliment him. It's a sin. Everybody does it. It's a sin. Doesn't matter. Almost everybody speaks Nashonara. Doesn't make it right. 80% are Mechalele Shabbat. Doesn't make it right. People watch terrible movies. Doesn't make it right. People eat in restaurant without checking once their kashrut. Doesn't make it right. Religious people do things they're not supposed to do. All of us. I'm not talking to you that I'm here and you there. I'm talking, include all of us, all of us, with no exception to the rule. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. So, there are four groups who does not accept Shekhinah. One, people that kiss up. 
חנופה, kissing up, so great, don't worry, so what if you מחלל שבת? But you have such a good heart, I'm sure Hashem loves you just as much as he loves Rabbi Akiva. <laughs> Even the Chiloni doesn't know what this cuckoo wants from him. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what it wants. Oh, you're such a tzaddik. Come, come, put fill in. Give me a nice check here in the box. Oh, if you only knew how much Hashem loves you. He loves me, look at me, I'm full of tattoos. So what? But you're a Jew. But I have a Christine, my girlfriend. So what? Hashem loves everyone. I have four kids from Zera Amalek. Because she's German, granddaughter of Eichmann. Oh, don't worry. Look at you, you're putting tefillin. You're such a tzaddik. Add a zero to the check, please. Now you're even a bigger tzaddik. All these fakers, they have a special section for them in hell. With their nice beard and sombreros. Special section for them. You know why? Because they are the reason why so many wicked people remain wicked. Not once they rebuke them. We don't rebuke. It's against our shita. You have a different Torah than the rest of the nation of Israel. In every holy book it says you must rebuke your friends, your colleagues. Who am I to rebuke? Who am I to rebuke? What do you mean? If someone mechalel Shabbat and you are Shomer Shabbat, you cannot tell him it's not allowed? No. Hashem loves everyone. <laughs> but you know it's a lie. The Torah clearly says who Hashem hates. They don't care. Just like the Muslim don't care that in the in Quran it's written 43 times that Hashem gave the land of Israel to the Jews. And not one time the word Palestine is mentioned. You know why? Because there was no Palestine. It's a made-up name from 1964. They don't have one history book. They never had a government. They never had an army. They never had a land. They never had anything. There's no history of Palestine. They can't even pronounce the letter P. They can't say Palestine. They say Palestine. 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 <laughs> the biggest scam! There's no history. There's nothing, there's no such place. The whole world knows about this scam. Everyone cooperate with the evil. So, you know, people know there's one truth and they do whatever they want. That's it. They want to steal the land from us. They want to kill us all. They will continue screaming their lies from the river to the sea. And the rest of the Nazis will join the party. If you have a big enemy, and then you have a small enemy, who are you afraid of more? The big enemy or the small enemy? The big enemy. What happens if your small enemy started a war against your big enemy? What do you do? Offer him friendship and to become his ally. People ask you, well, how come you're cooperating with your enemy? He's not my enemy. Why are you speaking like this? It's a tzaddik. It's a great guy. Well, just a week ago you say he's Rasha Merusha. Oh, you didn't understand me. You took things out of the context. I never say he's wicked. Ah, now he's serving your purpose, your agenda. So he became a tzaddik. Now it's kosher to join him. What about everything you say a week ago? A week ago he was my enemy. Now he's the enemy of my biggest enemy. So immediately I kosherized him. <laughs> Mamash almost done. A few more lines and we're done. So Rabotai, this is what it says. That's kissing up. Someone that speaks positive about the wicked. Who meapech bischuto shelo befanav. He is protecting him even though the wicked person is not here right now. Not because he's afraid of him. Someone is attacking an evil person that is standing right here. You're afraid of him, so you defend him. But if he wasn't here, you wouldn't defend him. 
So now he's not here. Why are you defending him? That means you really believe that you should protect him. You're not kissing up to him because he's not here. He's in a different city. But you love him. He's your cousin. He gives you money. He sends you business. He's a chassid from your community. There's reasons why you like this wicked person. To avat Hashemu, you are abomination for defending your own cousin or brother or friend or who knows what. Knowing is wicked and you defend him for personal reasons. You speak highly about him. You protect him when the rabbi condemned him. When the rabbi warned not to go to his party, you begin to be his lawyer. No, it's not true. He's a great guy. I know him. You know him? You know him that he's wicked. Why you defend him? Because he gives you money. He got you into your job. Maybe he got you the job. Maybe he made your shiduch. There's reasons for it. A person, and this is where we finish today, must, Adam, chayav. Chayav means obligated. Lisno et oive Hashem. Don't say, I say, Adam chayav lisno et sonei Hashem. Everyone who fight against God, against the yeshivot, promote gay parades, promote corruption, promote Zionism, communism, socialism, anti-God, anti-Israel, etc. It's mitzvah to hate them. It's an obligation to hate them. Where does it say it? Psalms 139, verse 21. King David, the holiest person, one of the holiest ever lived, one of the most loved people by Hashem, is bragging in Tehillim, in a book of God, how much he hates the wicked people who goes against Hashem. If it was a bad thing to hate the wicked, what are you complimenting yourself about doing something wrong? The law, you know God how much I hate your enemies. You know how much I hate your haters. You have to put them down as much as possible. Never to speak highly about them. Always to put them down. That's a sign that you love Hashem. Someone that spit at your God, you put them down to the bottom of the bottom. You never even hint any positive things about them. Say to a Muslim something against Muhammad, they will chop your head off. Even though it's all a fake religion. You hurt my five feet, you won't live another minute. Curse their Allah in their face, see what will happen to you and your children. They will die, but they will revenge. You just insulted their God. They don't even have the divine religion. They're willing to die for the honor of what they believe in. We that have the real God, the real Torah, we got it in front of millions of witnesses. People that curse the halacha, curse the yeshivot, curse the chachamim, make a mockery out of the Torah, became the heroes of the community. They put them on a religious magazine here in Brooklyn with no shame. Give them a weekly column. They are invited for $15,000 an event to come speak their heresy. You know how much he wanted to pay in Boca Raton to the missionary? More than $30,000 to come spread Christianity in his shul. <laughs> Ask him, I would like to bring Rav Moshe Sternbuch, Gdol Ador, the Posek of the generation right now, close to 100 years old. But you have to give him $30,000. So for free, I don't want him. He's too fanatic for me. He won't agree that he will come to speak in his shul. He won't agree. For free. Forget about $30,000. For Dr. Ruth, who knows how much he paid her to come to this field. 
to that missionary who knows how much. You tell them, I want to bring Rav Ovadia to speak. I want to bring Rav Sternenboch to speak. I want to bring someone that screamed the truth. Don't worry, you don't have to pay, for free. They won't step here. Who is Loba from Spad? <sighs> Rabotai, Kmo Shenemar Uvozai Ikalu. Hashem said, those who disrespect me should be cheap in your eyes. Put them down. And this Jew, not only does he hate them, it doesn't put them down, he loves them. Ve'yechabdam, and will respect them. Ve'yatzdikam, it's, okay, it's true, God needs us. He has no right to tell us what to do, he's right. Ve'kama lo avonot ve'chataot, how many sins these guys are accumulating for defending these heretics. Ki b'chvod ha'reshaim, when you highlight the wicked, when you lift them up, when you publish them, when you make videos of them, when you organize events for them, titchazekna yedei achotim, the evil in the world becomes stronger, they have more fans. Ki b'chvod ha-reshaim, techezekna yedei achotim, velo yeshakcu b'nei adam et ha-averot, People will not be disgusted from their behavior, from their heresy, from their evil behavior. People will get used to this heresy. That's not, it's, it's beautiful. It's brilliant. The wicked will take control over the righteous. That's what's happening now in Israel. Talmidei yeshivot that treat them like garbage. They breed thanks to them, and they treat them like garbage. Ve'yud varav nishmaim, the wicked, the heretic, become more and more popular, million views, half a million views. It's all your fault, those who didn't condemn it. Ve'yimshoch rabim acharav, ve'gam yashpil ha'tzadikim ve'achachamim, automatically puts the righteous down. Because he say, ah, oh, look at them, they're vile, they're radical, they are extreme, stay away from them, that's not the way, should accept everyone. As because of that, people don't want to listen to the real speakers. And those speakers who could have saved thousands more, did not save them because of wicked fans like you that organized lecture to these heretics. V'to'avat resha yeshar derech. They hate, everything that is abomination is off the path. For them it's honest, it's straight. And it's written, bet reshaim ishmad ve'ohel yesharim yafriach. The house of the wicked will be destroyed. Every time it says shmad means for eternity, shmad, a permanent spiritual death. The oil yesharim yafriach, place of the righteous will bloom. Uvinaten kavod la reshaim veshefel atzadikim. When you elevate the wicked and put down the righteous, en amon aham meadrim avodat Hashem. People look at the religion as eh, not so important. That's a genocide to the Jewish nation, a genocide, a holocaust, a spiritual holocaust. Ki ha'olam bra'o Hashem idvarach lichvodo. Hashem made the world for his honor. The Jews are the one who's supposed to spread the truth to the world. Jews have to condemn all evil. They have to condemn the wicked. They have to condemn heresy and infidels. They have to love the good and hate the bad. Everyone who speaks against God immediately has to be a target to the Jews to condemn them. 
And everyone righteous, you have to run after them, support them, love them, kiss them, hug them, give them money, give them kavod, defend them even with your life. That's a kosher Jew. Today it's the exact opposite. The exact opposite. Ask the religious teenagers who they admire. Check in their pockets what cards and pictures they have. They admire Rav Eliashiv, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, or they admire the athletes of the NBA, or the football, or the baseball, or all kinds of goish singers. Who they admire? How the kids grew up like this? How? Just one generation ago, the dream of every child was to be a huge, holy Talmud Chacham. You would ask the kids back then, what, what's your dream? I want to be this tzaddik, that tzaddik. Today there's no more honor for the tzaddikim. The biggest clouds are their heroes. You can see, you can see uh, some of these interviews that they make with these people. It's hard to believe. And they have fans. This gay field that lives with a husband made a, made a show here in uh, Flatbush. We went after the lecture here on a Tuesday night. We wanted to grab a sandwich on the burger place here in Coney Island. Usually around 1 a.m. when I finish here, we have five people barely in a place. It's a big place. If maybe 200 seats. Not even five people at 1 a.m. Five, seven people. It's all empty. We came. Packed. More than 200 seats are taken. And people standing outside on a, on a sidewalk. I walk in with Simantov. So what's going on here? Who came out? This guy, Jonathan, the... The host with the, with the camera and the microphone who make videos of rabbis, he came out. I asked him, what's going on over here? He said to me, there was a show here. They all came after the show to eat. Now I'm looking at the people, 200, all look very orthodox. I'm not talking clowns from modern places. Black hats, tzitziot. I ask him, what show? Show? He told me that comedian, Modi, Modi, Modi. I say, ma? All these religious people with black hats, they went to the show of this field. They went, these people that sit in a day and learn Gemara, they went to look at his face. That's the end of us. There's no more Jewish nation. We finished. We're done. People that sit in yeshivot, they go to a show of a man that lives with another man and brag about it. They are the enemies of Hashem. They don't understand that, Bichlal. Why are you sitting next to the Gemara? If I would be your Rosh Yeshiva, I would throw you out of there. I would not give you permission to come learn. Go learn in your house. Go learn with him, Hevruta, with his field. What are you doing in the Yeshiva, Bichlal? Who gave you permission to enter? Go first be an, a human being, then come to learn. You walk with a black hat and tzitziot like this, and you sit in such a chilul Hashem. For nights I couldn't sleep from anger. I told you names, go and ask if it happened or not. Ask Jonathan, ask Simanto. Right away we turn around and say, better to be hungry for a week, not to eat, go home. This is the face of the community. And now when they hear what I just say, they will have what to say, don't worry. Oh, fanatic, he's an extremist. That's not the way. In Israel they have a say. We will see in the end who will be laughing. Let them laugh now and enjoy and make fun. We will all meet in the end. We will meet in the end. The question is on what side you want to be. You want to be a man of the truth? Forget about me, I'm not a factor here. I'm not, a, I'm not looking for fan clubs. 
don't have to come to me בכלל, לא? Let's head it. Find yourself a place, I don't mind. The question is, do you want to follow the truth, or you want to follow all these fakers? Some people wrote to me in the last two days. He said, it breaks my heart to see that these guys that make the videos, until now they made good videos, that they put the clown from Boca. They spread it to 50,000 people. From Mezake Arabim, overnight they became Mahdi Arabim. It's fragile. One minute you're saving thousands, and the next morning you are a mass murderer of souls. It can turn like this. In one minute, you mezake Arabim, you publish good videos, people get inspired. And then you put one of these clowns and you lost everything. Lo chaval, isn't it breaking the heart like this? Rabotai, conclusion, don't count on the United States, don't count on the doctors, don't count on the Israeli politicians, do not count on the weapon and on the Air Force and the rest of the world, and don't count, maybe the Arabs will decide, maybe they release the hostages, hopefully it'll mean, forget about all this. It's only one thing to think about and to hope for. To make peace with Hashem. That's it. We want to find favors in your eyes, Hashem. We want to limtso chen be'enecha. Ve'noach matza chen be'ene Hashem. And Hashem made the Egyptian find favors, and the Jews find favor in the eyes of the Egyptian overnight. Yesterday there were Nazi murderers killing Jewish babies, throwing them into the Nile choking them, torturing them, stealing their homes and property, all of a sudden they all became lovers of Israel. How can it be? Hashem decided, that's it. Until now they were hostile. I turned the mood. Come, Jews, come, take some jewelry. Don't leave empty and dead. Can we give you, what can we do for you? All of a sudden they like them. Ah, yesterday they wanted to slaughter me. What happened now you come to hug me? Hashem decided. Whom activate this goyim? They don't have their own acti activation mode. Hashem activate them on his computer. Sinwar, wake up. Yes, what should I do? Rosh Hashanah, I wrote 1,500 casualties. Yalla, start preparing. Of course, they don't know it. They, we, they choose to come to murder. When they choose to come to murder, they have these plans for decades. They fail usually. But now in Rosh Hashanah, Hashem wrote that it will happen. Everyone all of a sudden became blind. The guards, the people by the border, the Air Force, the generals, the prime minister, everyone is asleep. Cameras. Cameras, everything is sabotage. What's going on? In Rosh Hashanah, I wrote 1,500 dead and kidnapped. That's it. The cameras won't work. The prime minister will be drunk. All the police generals will be in Elat in a vacation weekend. And the rest will be in parties in Elat. They won't leave any guards. Why? Because Hashem wrote in Rosh Hashanah a tragedy. That's it. With the army, without the, with the best equipment, I wrote 15,000 dead, 1,500 dead. That's it. Nothing can change my ruling except tshuva. If instead of dancing around Buddha with cigarettes and drugs and naked women, they would be dancing around the Torah and saying, Hashem, we love you, we want to become righteous, maybe we'll cancel the decree. A minute before the tragedy can still be cancelled. Now we know that the decree wasn't cancelled as going on, as, as, as it's still going, six months already. We're not anywhere today, we're not in any better place today than we were in, in October 7. They say that they think they killed 16,000 Hamas terrorists. There are millions 
waiting, begging to get their jobs. Salary, weapon, to go and kill Jews, you know, for them, it's a great upgrade. You kill 16,000, one million are begging to take their place, age 12 and up. What are you gonna do, kill another million? You run out of money, you're bankrupt, your, your country is finished. The country in and out is finished, the economy is finished, everything will be done. Another six months like that and there's no more Israel. What's going to be? Maybe we'll have to go back to exile again. We don't know what Hashem is planning for us. We learn week by week. But if you cry over what the United States did yesterday, and if you cry that Canada doesn't want to sell us weapons, and if you cry that Colombia wants to disconnect the relationship with us, and many other countries you're going to hear in the next few weeks, don't cry over it. It's not worth to cry. It actually should make you happy. Why? Because one of the things that will have to happen then when Mashiach comes and Hashem comes to take revenge against all these nations, that they will reach the highest level of hypocrisy, of wickedness, of ungratefulness, of antisemitism. The Goim have to reach the highest level of wickedness. That when Hashem will bury them, they won't have any excuse. They won't say one thing, they won't be able to say to defend themselves. If they are pro-Israel, if Canada would continue to give money, to, uh, I mean, a weapon to Israel, they will have a very solid case. We helped your children for self-defense. Why you, why you want to wipe us out? If all the Democrat, lefty, liberal, wicked people here in America would come and say, well, yes, we're not exactly righteous, but we helped Israel for six months, who gave them weapon? Who passed all these laws? We are all Democrats. The president is a Democrat. His, his group around him all passed those laws, helping Israel, sending them, sending a big boat in the, in the first month to the, to the, so now they lost it all. It's all good for us. You're looking at it the other way around. You don't want your enemy to start doing you favors. Because if he will do 1,000 bad things to you, and then in the end he's going to do four or five good things to you, all the 1,000 things won't count. He will get away with that. Because they did tshuva. Look at the Germans. They are the smarter of anyone. If there's any country in the world that went with Israel full time, from the beginning to the end, are the Germans. <laughs> Unbelievable. These Germans who made a holocaust to us, they are all together pro-Israel. Condemn Hamas, condemn Palestinians. We are with you 100%. There's no other country like this. These Germans, they have guilty feelings. It's enough we murdered them once in much bigger numbers. We will now support Hamas who murdered them and wants to destroy them and make another holocaust. They feel guilty. The guilt made them do the right thing. I don't know what other things they do. Not everything is published. But besides them, there's now one country who supports Israel fully. How many people condemn the Hamas? You saw in the United Nations, Russia is for them, China is for them. Everyone voted with them. The United States was not voting with Israel. They would just veto the United Nations decision. And now they'd stop veto. Meaning, until now, United States also not happy with Israel. But they were canceling the vote. And now they didn't agree to cancel. Meaning, okay, now we, we are closer to these evil countries. But it's good, because it's written, Am levadad ishkon, this is the prophecy of Bilam to the end of days. The Jews will be totally isolated. This verse can be translated both ways. It's a two-way street. Meaning the Goim would count us as trash. Dust in the wind. Leaves that needs to be dumped to the garbage. Things that has to be put on flame. That's how they look at us, the Jews. The more we kill them, the better it is. That's the situation right now. 
ובגויים לא יתחשב, it can also be the other way around. That the Jews will reach a situation that they will know nobody is with us. We don't have one friend in the world except Hashem. And that's what will save us. As long as we count on the Air Force, we're losing. We count on the government, we are losing. We counting on the United States, it causes us damage. We counting on other countries, it costs us damage. We counting on the Israeli army and the soldiers, it causing us damage. It's not helping us like you think. Most religious Jews, they think vice versa. They want Trump to take over. He goes against Iran. He will do to the Palestinians what he did, close their offices, shut their aid, shut their mouth, will support Israel again, will fight terrorism, will close the border, will kick out all the, the Islam from the United States. And what will happen? The Jews will have a new God, Mr. Trump, just like a few years ago. And Hashem said, oh, you, you, your friends are back to help you. You don't need me. Remember the story from before? The father said to his son, I'm, I'm going to help you. I have enough to help you. I can save you. I can... No, I don't need you. My friends will help me. This friend, that friend. When all the friends went away, who did he go back to? To the father. So when the friends went against the son, was it good or a bad thing? It was a wonderful thing. That reunited him with his father. What will get the Jews back to where they're supposed to is this hatred of the hypocrite world. The world is a big, has big hypocrisy. Every one of these countries will wipe out Gaza 50 times worse than what we did. Nobody would care about civilians running, looking for them inside the hallways, in the basement. They would, probably the United States will dump a nuclear bomb on them. What? Or Russia. Tefillah, we should do all the time. Not Yom Tefillah. Every day is Yom Tefillah. Every day we have to pray. We have to pray, first of all, for the life of Jews that are being killed. We, want, we, we pray to Hashem to have mercy that the casualties will be less and less. That's an obligation. No Baolim Chavero. You know that another 20, 30 soldiers are about to die. If you can pray all day and cry, and maybe half of them will not die. Thanks to your prayers, you just save life. But it's more important to pray that the wicked Jews will do tshuva. Better that they'll repent, that they shouldn't get killed. If there is no chance that they will do tshuva, better for them and for the world that they will go out of here. People like Bernie Sanders, the faster he leaves the world, the better it is for everyone. Also for himself. If he died today or he will die another six months, I promise you one thing. He will regret very much the extra six months he leave. Because that made his hell another few thousand years of suffering. Because every day that this trader monster is on earth, his account in the next world is gaining much more and more punishment. Now many of us would love to get rid of this field. It's an enemy of God, an enemy of the Jewish people. He's a self-hated Jew, he's a traitor. He's begging the United States to choke Israel, to destroy us. He's pro-Hamas, pro-horrible things. Everything about him is bad. You cannot find one good thing to say about this monster. But it's actually better that he lives long. The more he lives, the more he's going to get what he deserves. Chuck Schumer and all the rest of the wicked traders. People who betray the whole nation. She was Yudi. Yeah. And you know who was the biggest trader? Henry Kissinger. Remember Henry Kissinger who just died 100 years old? He was the biggest trader. Just like this, Bernie. He's also married to you know what, Henry Kissinger, in the Yom Kippur War, when we are about to die, all of us, Israel is about to be finished in the next day or two, he refused to give us weapon. The, the president, the guy, what his name was, Nixon. Ford? Nixon? Nixon, the guy! So I must help Israel. The Jews say, no, don't send weapon to Israel. The guy say, I must help them. 
this is what's going on. You have to listen to my lecture from last night about Amalek. You have to find out who is the Amalek of today. You'll be very surprised. You think Amalek is the Germans, the Nazis, the Hamas. Besides them, there are much more Amalekim around the corner from where you live. Sometimes in your synagogue, you sit here and Amalek sit two rows behind or in front of you. Amalek, it's a concept. Rav Sternbuch, Gdol Ador, he wrote in Parashat Zachor, beautiful Dvar Torah. I made a whole lecture about it, two hours lecture. Who is the Amalek of today? And he gives a beautiful proof from the words of the Rambam in two different places. When the Rambam speaks about the seven nations that lived in the land of Canaan, the Rambam writes, but they already are gone. They are wiped out from the world. That means we don't have to worry about them anymore. When the Rambam speaks about Amalek, he doesn't say, but they're already gone. The reason that the seven nations are gone, because there was a king, um, Sancheriv, that mixed all the nations. So we don't know anymore who is Knani, who is Amorites, who is Girgashi, and who is the Evusi. We don't know. They got mixed with the world. Therefore, we don't have to worry about the hatred for these seven idol worshippers, wicked nation. Because they got mixed with the rest of the world, and they are vanished. <coughs> the same thing you can say about Amalek. Amalek got mixed in the world. Nobody knows who's Amalek today. You don't know. This guy, that guy. Maybe yes, maybe not. We don't know. The Rambam doesn't write. Amalek is gone. From the Rambam you see that Amalek is alive and kicking and destroying us every second. So who is this Amalek? That was the lecture yesterday. Molanim, no? Molanim a large part of the Amalek. The Torah already told us, Another principle. If you think that the Goim are your destroyers, the Hamas or the Nazis or the Russians or the Hezbollah, you got it all wrong. All the damages of the Jewish people from day one until the end of days are all coming only from Jewish people. There's not one go in history who ever made any damage to the Jewish nation. Not Nazis, not Arabs, no one. Every bad thing that happened to us came only because of Jews. If Hashem decided to make us a Holocaust, that means millions will die. It's because of us, because of the intermarriage, assimilation, betraying the Torah, Betraying Halakha, changing the Sidur to Berlin instead of Jerusalem. Hashem said, that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. Same thing with the Arabs. It's all coming on us from people inside us. The traders, the Mechalele Shabbat, the gays, the gays parade, the corrupted politician. The hope that we have in these wicked people that they will be the God to save us. This is all the reasons of all our suffering. There are some people in the world, not that many, that their Ashkafa is very, very clean and pure. They have zero, zero expectation or anything with the rest of the world. They don't hate anyone, they don't expect anything from the United States or from the Zionists or from the wicked Israeli government or from the army or from the police or from anyone. They already understand everything exactly how it works. It's a little bit hard to live in such a world when everyone is mistaken. I once asked a question. <clears throat> What's better, to be a genius living with millions of fools, or everyone around you is dumb fool, or to be a fool living in, surrounded by thousands of genius people? Which one of the two scenarios is better? You are a genius and everyone around you is a total moron. Or you are the moron and everyone around you is a genius. If you had to choose which part in a film to take, to be the fool surrounded by geniuses, or to be the genius surrounded by fools. <laughs> Which one of the two you would choose? I'd rather be the fool surrounded by geniuses. 
You are the bit of genius. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם שהכל נהיה בדברו. Right to me your answers. רבי מזרחי את ג'ימל דת קאם. ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן. רבי חנניה בן הקשיא אומר, רצה לו לזכות את ישראל, לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות